China, the world's oldest civilization was born here. Thousands of years later, it is one of the world's chess powerhouses. For most of the past 30 years, China has held the most prestigious title in women's chess. The legacy of the Women's World Championship is rich. Menchik, Gaprindashvili and Chibodonitsa, Kostenyuk, Zizhun and Ho Yifan. Now three-time world champion Zhu Wenjun is defending her title once more. After vanquishing the likes of Katerina Lagno and Alexandra Goryashkina, another rival awaits. Challenger Lei Tingzhe had to defeat three grandmasters in matches herself to get here. In the first two rounds of the candidates, she took on sisters Maria and Anna Muzichuk and won. Then in the final, she beat former world champion Tang Zhongyi. And that's it! Resignation! Lei Tingzhi, the winner of the 2023 Honey Dates Finals. Will Ju Wenjun defend, or will we have a first time champion, Lei Tingzhi? Half the match is in Ju's hometown of Shanghai, half the match in Chongqing, where Lei hails from. Who will win and claim their share of the 500,000 euro prize fund? 
Welcome to the official broadcast of the 2023 FIDE Women's Chess Championship. Hello everyone and a big welcome to Game 7 of the Women's World Championship Match 2023 and the tension is rising as we proceed into the second half of the match and along with the tension the action has moved 1,700 kilometers upstream the, over the Yatsi River and uh, to the mega city of Chongqing. Will this change of pace inspire and motivate our two players? Well, as we see challenger Lei Ting Jae and reigning three-time women's world champion Ju Wen Jun return to their playing balls, their playing boards there in Chongqing. Well, I'm your host, international master Ivanka Halska, and it's a great pleasure to be commentating all the action alongside someone who has just smashed the legends. She is the only woman to have broken the 2700 barrier mark. She is also the only woman to have played in a world championship tournament. Also the only woman to have beaten Gary Kasparov. I mean, she's done so many things. She's also an author. She's also a mentor. Just an overall extraordinary person. It is none other than Grandmaster Judith Polgar. Judith, good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm happy to be here with you again. <laughs> Are you excited about uh, the Women's World Championship match? Well, I think it's getting to a very tense situation to the second half. And of course, right now we see that Ju and Jun will have to strike back and she may have to choose a different strategy than what she was dealing so far. Definitely. We will see whether the players do have new strategies up their sleeves. And uh, talking about new things, uh, the last time we were commenting together was in Norway Chess. And what have you been up to in the meantime? Well, I do a lot of things. First of all, I'm working on a, on a book series for children with my method. It's a series of six books, so that's very engaging. And also, I just came back from uh, Chile, where I gave uh, some talks and uh, simultaneous exhibitions and meeting with people. So that was also very fruitful and uh, very demanding, but lots of fun at the same time as well. Sounds exciting and I definitely can't wait to see more of those six books using your teaching methods because if you can inspire more people to break those records like you just did, well, well, uh, we are in for a treat. And uh, talking about in for a treat, well, uh, let's have a look at the action so far. And uh, we've had six games played between Ju Wenjun and Lei Tingjie in the wonderful city of Shanghai. Now the action has moved to Chongqing, but here goes, you know, game one was a tense affair. Lei Tingjie starting with the white pieces. It does look like on paper, it was a very calm and safe and steady draw. It was after all a Berlin, but it was anything but. It was very tense and Lei Ting Jie did have an opportunity to actually get a big advantage, but she missed it. And uh, game two, also another tense KG affair, Lei Ting Jie once again actually pushing. And then the players had a pause and then game three and game four. And there it was all about Ju Wen Jun, Lei Ting Jie blundering with the white pieces, but somehow holding on, Ju Wen Jun pressing. And then of course, that fantastic game five where Lei Ting Jie actually broke the deadlock and she defeated Ju Wen Jun with the white pieces. And game six, that seemed to be Lei Ting Jie's territory. She's come very well prepared. She's uh, working with very esteemed grandmaster Timur Rajabov. And uh, let's take a look at the head to heads. She's easily neutralized Ju Wen Jun with this fantastic home preparation and uh, there we can see the stats Ju Wen Jun the more experienced competitor do any of these statistics surprise you Judith uh, well uh, yeah it's interesting that Ju Wen Jun has uh, has an overall uh, clear lead right but of course we are now in the world championship match and uh, it is something that uh, completely different 
the match has yeah. such a different uh, spirit. It's so different than a tournament. Definitely, it's much more at cagey. And after all, I feel like the match plays, they're, they're all about little different elements, the psychology, the over the board. And uh, there we can see the players. They're sitting there, getting ready to focus, getting ready to play their moves. And uh, looking at Lei Ting Jie, she's very expressive. And is this something that you used to do? Close your eyes and try to settle into your thoughts. Did you have a pre-game ritual, Judith? Uh, yes, kind of. First of all, I arrived also uh, a few minutes early to the game, five, ten minutes or so, of course, depending on the tournament situation and how many people are playing. But of course, uh, I played some matches also in my life. I was not a big match player myself, but I know that it has every breathing, every move has the double of, uh, of the, the value. So. Of course, when, when you're battling it out in a match, it's, it's so different. And it's so interesting for me to see them sitting there ready for a few minutes and we see close-ups also for both players. And somehow I can feel that, you know, somehow Juve and Jun is thinking, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to be turning over things, etc. While I see uh, Lei, who is very confident that I'm the leading person in the match i'm here i have all my self-confidence but already now you can see that okay now it's already time to focus on the game nothing else so it is really uh, interesting to see their body language also uh and and to, to to feel what the what can go in their mind i mean you can see i mean look they didn't make a single move and it's like <laughs> you could see the same <laughs> exact thing but i think also lay is probably closing her eyes and somehow gets into the mood in the focus completely but mm -hmm. uh, it could be move 29 time travel situation right by the body language <laughs> it, <laughs> it certainly could be from, from late in yeah actually from both of them you do feel the tension and uh, talking about tension the players have had two days rest of course because of the change of location and uh, to get over all the tiredness and that uh, tr changing location brings. Do you think that this will have an impact on the players? I mean, for Ju Wenjun, she's used to this. All of her previous World Championship matches have involved this break. You know, the first time in 2018, she, it was exactly the same. First half Shanghai, second half in uh, Chongqing. And uh, when it came to her match against Alexandra Goreshkina, it was the same. It was Shanghai and then Vladivostok. And there we see the players shake hands. And for Leiting J, this is her home city. We are going to get some action. Well, I think it's also interesting when you play in your home city, whether what, how does it affect you? Oh, um, hang on, I'm going to have to stop you there, Judith, because big surprise. It's yours. It's your <laughs> opening. I have <laughs> never, ever seen Ju Wan Jun play the Kara Khan. And wow, it is my opening. And certainly this has uh, Harry Krishna's finger marks all over it because, of course, he does play the Kara Khan. And look at, Lei look, Jay herself has dabbled in it. What a look, surprise. Look at the impression of Lei, uh, what she she thinks. I mean, it was a full confusion, right? So it's a great uh, strategy, I think. I don't know what will be the outcome of the game, but you can see the impression. I mean, it tells a lot. It certainly does say a lot. And uh, well, here we're coming to a big crossroads. And um, also, what is the best approach for Lei Tingjie? Because she can choose to play strategically. I would say that this opening is quite risky. She can advance the pawn from e4 to e5, but you do have to know what you're doing. And in the sense that once black has completed the development, if white hasn't put any pressure, then of course, black is ready for the counterattack of c5. But that's why uh, Leighton J says, no, you know what? I'm gonna play my knight out to d2. And uh, now we have, the main line. So it's going to be an interesting idea. So bishop f5 played. So they are battling in the old main line. Knight f6 instead of uh, 
has become very, very trendy. I'd love to hear takes, but uh, that has been well worked out. And, and it's uh, a very different something. structure as well. Exactly. And uh, bishop f5 is okay, way more reasonable. And uh, now we could be seeing 17 moves of theory. And uh, the knight now is coming back to g3 to attack the bishop. And this is white's point. White absolutely has to chase down that bishop if you want to get an advantage. You know, it's funny that uh, when I see this opening since I first visited China, which was like uh, 20, no, it was long, long time ago, 15 years ago or something. 2001 or something like that more 20 years ago <laughs> <laughs> and i was making simultaneous exhibitions as well and at one point i had such a tough simuls and one of the little girls you know this very lovely girl smiley long hair uh, tight uh, done the, on both sides and she was yeah. just making the first 17 moves of this exact opening, this classical Karakan. If I would have been playing with Bareyev, you know, and I'm looking like, where am I? And I was playing in a small city, you know, <laughs> and you know, like, <laughs> what's going on? Like a little eight year old is just, you know, instantly and, you know, with full of confidence, making the first 17 moves of the Karakan. So each time I see this position, it comes to mind. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of theory in this and again we reach a crossroad because uh, the whole issue is whether the white knight will be allowed to jump into e5 so you can play e6 you can play knight f6 and allow that jump or you can go knight to d7 and prevent it big moment from Wang Jun and uh, I'm very excited to see how uh, how she will handle this variation because it can get very complicated. But I think the main idea for Juven Jun and I, that she had the courage, she understood that she has to take a different path in the match, because I think this is one of the most important, especially in the match, to try to confuse, confuse your opponent, try to, to bring her out from the comfort zone, because it's clear that for, uh, for Lighting G, it was, okay, I'm in the lead, this game seven, second half of the match, I'm going to be playing whatever I decide to play against your Berlin, right? Uh, it's me who is choosing, right? To go in whatever line in the Berlin, or go to the Italian, or play the Scotch, or whatever. And then you could see when Karakan showed up on the board, that it was confusing. And even look at, the, look at her now, like, She's trying to show that she has all the self-confidence and everything is under control, but still it's, it was an unexpected uh, story for her. And uh, we'll see how she will be able to manage. Of course, the, the position and the whole system is extremely stable for White also. But she has to make up her mind which direction she goes, how much she wants to push, if she wants to go only for, uh, for uh, drawish line, and the tension will be there. The tension yeah. will be there. Def definitely the tension will be there. And uh, one thing that I know about this type of position, a lot of it is based on experience. Like, for instance, there's a lot of ways that you can trick your opponent just by understanding the plans and also understanding like what in games are good. So, for instance, if uh, one, the line that I always liked was to actually put the knight to d7 while the G engine is considering what to do. But okay, this does have an element of risk. I'm just gonna put the knight there. And then after h5 here. And then what you're gonna see is these like long lines of theory. Hang on, where's, where's my knight? Because the bishop will come to d3 first. And then after the bishops get traded off, this position is very, very sharp, but white will castle queenside and black perhaps it can also castle queenside, but invariably tends to castle kingside. And then you have this issue of like whether white can get this kingside attack. And that's very sharp. You do need to know what you're doing there. But often I found that I could trick people, you know, by making small little moves. Like for instance, instead of going bishop e7, I would go bishop d6 at the right time. And uh, just utilizing the, the uh, long-term idea is that this h-pawn could be a liability. It could be a strength for white. And... Uh, 
we'll see whether Ju Wenjun, you know, she has been studying this, especially in those uh, two day pauses. Will she be able to should you like master all these kind of new little nuances or not? Well, I believe that she should have been preparing this before the match itself. If she came mm -hmm. up with this system just to, in two days, that's a very risky story because this is, you know, it the best that you have to understand the ins and outs of the position of play of the Karakan. It is such a special uh, uh, structure. There is not even another uh, uh, opening which uh, which comes uh, similar, I think, oh, yeah. than this. I mean, no. there are some. I mean, sometimes the the French can transpose, but not here because from the French, the famous trademark of the French having the bishop on c8, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's out there. It's being hunted. So you, <laughs> yeah. But the pawn structure is very similar. Yeah, but generally speaking, in this position, white can get advantage uh, very difficult if you know what you're doing with black. But at the same time, you have to understand the middle game patterns here. If you don't understand the middle game patterns and the small details in it, then you, you can get easily in huge trouble. Yeah, uh, you absolutely no doubt can. And uh, instead, she's gone for a very solid line, putting the pawn on e6. At the same time, it's a provocation also, I believe, that she does not want yes. to go knight d7 to the classical solid h5, bishop d3, which you showed just before. But okay, so what do you want? Are you going to play knight e5? You're going to be active. You want to be very concrete now. So it's it's kind of asking questions from uh, from Lai Ting Ji. And uh, I do believe that Lei Ting Jie will put the knight on e5, but then again, the mind games continue because if you have studied this line, then knight e5 is the first move that you look at. And knight e5 on the board, the bishop coming to h7. Oh, and now bishop d3 is a but very you can, normal move. You can see Lei Ting Jie how she's like searching, searching in her memory. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop d3 played and uh, usually white tries to say you know what you used a lot of time to get your bishop to h7 let's trade off light squares and oh ho ho and she's also walked away from the board and one other unusual thing about this uh, world championship match is that both players have been very present at the board you know even when one of them has been taking a very long think doesn't matter they have had company it's they do actually have resting rooms where they can go and they can just simply get some refreshments and also just pace but nope that hasn't been uh, chosen so uh, what are we going to see bishop takes bishop yeah i believe here there can be a blunder with black by playing queen d4 and knight f7 after that oh ah, yeah we we have to show that one so this one it's very tempting and everyone could be asking us, but why not play this? But this would not be a mistake. This would this would be a mistake <laughs> because after knight takes f7, then unfortunately you are going to get into problems and bishop takes d3 doesn't really solve anything because you have knight takes rook at the end of it. So you don't want to be falling into that trick. So let's let's show it also um, why King, King F7 was not. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. OK, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the fun part, the fun part of Knight F7. Yeah, I, I forgot. I was so, so I'm still in shock, actually, at the Karakam being played. It was not what I was thinking about. So Knight takes four, King takes Knight would be a terrible mistake because the Queens are facing against each other. But there is a bishop in the way. But if the bishop can remove itself with check, then uh, bishop takes. Whoops. The queen falls off the board. And uh, that would certainly be a disaster, especially at the Women's World Championship match. So that's definitely not going to be played by Ju Wenjun. But, you know, I'm kind of surprised that uh, the Ju Wenjun is thinking at this point. Isn't bishop d3 is the, yes. the main move? Yeah, that's the main move. I mean, I think I have seen knight d7 played. 
but that's a, that's a kind of a weird one. But uh, bishop takes d3 is the normal one, and then you back that up after with queen. Sorry. So this is very standard, and after queen takes d3, knight d7, you challenge the knight in the middle of the board. That for me is very standard. Yeah. It's in interesting. I find it interesting that she's uh, thinking right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm also, it just means that uh, once again, perhaps Ji Wenjun launched the first surprise, but Lei J carried on the pattern. So, yeah, I'm just, why is she not taking? Why is she, why is Ji Wenjun hesitating here? It's a bit of a mystery. And watching on the clock also. Well, it's a psychological game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Also, I believe. It is, it is a... Okay, well, we see Ji Wenjun. And has that ever happened to you? I mean, actually, let me just ask this question. Judging by what you see now, do you think that the Karakan was something they prepared before the Women's World Championship match? Okay, Bishop takes Bishop on the board. I think that they had to talk about it and some preparation must have been done because this is simply too dangerous. And especially knowing that Juven Jun is a world champion for, uh, for five years already and she has mm -hmm. a clear experience uh, how to deal with uh, different situations in a match. So I would be extremely surprised if they would not have uh, worked on it with her second. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to preparing for a match or preparing for a tournament such as this, I mean, you yourself have played in the World Championship tournament in 2005. Like, can you tell us a little bit about all the preparations that were involved? <laughs> Well, that was kind of special and different because it was uh, Kasparov just retired from competitive chess, right? So, so it was very clear that people, uh, including Topalov, who eventually won that world championship in 2005, they considered that there is a space for them suddenly. And, uh, and I was preparing for that uh, event, and I remember very well, my son was born just a few months before, so Oliver was, uh, was something less than a year old. And I was preparing in the summer, uh, going to my summer house, and I was like having heavy trainings with different uh, training partners, working every day. I really don't like running. But I said, no, I have to run, I have to do my physical training. But of course, when I woke up, I was with my son. In the evening, I gave the bath. In the between, I was uh, training. Mm -hmm. But somehow, I did not work the right way. That was the problem. So I was not efficient enough, and I didn't choose the right openings. And I think by the time I got to the event, I was also exhausted, and I didn't give myself also enough days before the tournament to recover from every way and of course everybody else was preparing crazy as well before so it's it's very difficult to 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 make the best preparation and a good timing for your form yeah. and things did not work out on my way the opening preparation especially against the nand in the Karakan, i lost uh, in a very <laughs> very bad way with uh, very unnecessary mistakes but of course, the World Championship, everybody is preparing so heavily, chess-wise, but also mentally, psychologically, and physically as well. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that, that you're preparing, but you didn't feel like you prepared in the right way. What is, the, in your opinion, the right way to prepare? Well, I think the right way is to, first of all, to stabilize your knowledge, your preparation. So the basics like you're going to do this 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 against e4 you play this against d4 you will play there against english you're going to play whatever and also with white you have a very clear vision in which direction you want to go so you're prepared on the concrete stuff but also mentally you have to be extremely resilient 
to be able to switch whenever things go wrong. How can you switch? Can you switch? And also mm -hmm. mentally that if things go wrong, how you can uh, exclude from your mind that you made some serious mistakes, let's say. And that yeah. it's not hunting your brain all the time, what kind of mistakes you were doing. And also you have to be very well balanced. First of all, not to get too tired before the event, but still keep this balance of, uh, of having the alertness, uh, being resilient. And, and of course your nerves system is very important that you can, uh, you are able to sleep also before the, the event, but especially during the event. Yeah, and uh, I'll definitely, I'm gonna, <laughs> you, you came up with some amazing points there and, and I really wanna delve into them a little bit further. But uh, I just wanted to mention, just before we do, that up until move 10, night to D7, the, the two were actually following that uh, famous match, uh, the famous game between Vichy Anand and Magnus Carlsen. And in that game, White actually played, didn't play queen e2, but instead played f4. And after bishop b4, actually I spoke to one of the seconds in, in this match and they were saying that the caro objectively perhaps wasn't the best choice for this. And after f bishop c3, bishop e7, and uh, black actually got quite an okay position after knight to gf6. And then here we come to the fun. So f4 is the main line, but uh, queen e2, let's go back. But I think played, it's so. interesting to, to highlight the fact that after f4, bishop b4, this is again something, a very typical move, which if you're, you're not aware and you're not playing the system so much, it's not necessarily that you would be playing bishop b4. But the idea of that to force c3, it's like somehow the pawn on c2 stands more stable. Like after c3, bishop goes back and bishop d2, what you showed. I mean, the bishop on d2, of course, would be more healthy, covered a5. Also after castle, so somehow the pawn on c3 is not so convenient. Somehow you want to push it to c4, right? Eventually. And, and there are so many of these small details in this Karakan, right? Where it's no big deal. It's not that it's bad for white, but as we know, pawns never move back in chess. So once the pawn is on c3, it can only go forward. And it can give yeah. a little weaknesses uh, around white's king after long castle. Definitely. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned that the, this particular variation is full of small nuances. Like, for instance, um, it is also possible after knight d7 to go bishop f4 and one possible response to this and again if you don't know it you wouldn't perhaps a, a dream of playing it is actually to go queen a5 check <laughs> again with that small point that c3 isn't going to be accurate because white wants to cast the queen side the a2 pawn will be loose in that situation and the whole idea is after queen a5 is that you know also again you can provoke this bishop to go back so like little small things that you do need to know but uh queen e2 played and queen e2 is an unusual move well it's not unusual but it's not the main main line so Ji Wenjin probably is going to be out of preparation. Personally, if I were Ji Wenjin, I would be quite happy because F4 has always appeared to me the very scary lines. And uh, Lei Ting Jie has moved away from her direct style of play. That's where she's in her comfort zone. Um, yes, Knight F6 is, yeah, is the main is, move. This, sorry, but this is going to be very interesting. Like, for example, when you get a surprise, you can you can tend to go into the safer area and this is mm -hmm. exactly what can be disturbing for for white i think and this is what juven jun maybe starts playing to make a confusion in uh, in lighting g's brain that am i playing for a win am i playing for initiative or I'm okay going solid and i don't want anything special i have the lead of the match because once you get a, you get this in your head that I'm leading in the match and maybe she can have a lot of fans out there in her home city, it can be six game is still too much to celebrate. 
okay yeah. so it can be disturbing i've seen this before when uh, when leko was leading against kramnik and he had a clear lead he had clear opportunities to make an extra draw really he he was like one from from one hand away to become a world champion and somehow it was like okay i have the lead draw is enough i don't have to win and so on so these are the things which can give extra confusion and extra chance for Juve and Jun to be able to turn around things or equalize the match. And this Queen E2 is like showing that I'm I'm on the solid side. So probably if if Lei would have been very well prepared and and knew that Karakan will be standing on the board, there is a great chance that her choice would be F4 because of her style. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with you. I think it was Boris Spassky who always or a Tigran Petrosian, whenever they were faced with a novelty, they always said we treat it with respect on the board, but at home we are gonna tear it apart. And uh, Queenie <laughs> two, but I just also wanted to stress to everyone watching Queenie two, it is a more solid choice, but it is not a passive choice by any mean. I'm I'm just looking at this database here, and like Isina Pomnia, she has played it and won. Ceparinov, who also is a big open export expert from Bulgaria, has also played it. I mean, White's idea is still very much to play Bishop D2 and uh, Castle Queenside, because after all, White has played H4. You kind of committed to this Queenside castling plan. And uh, the question for Ju Wanjun is: Once she's completed development, does she kind of go Knight F6? I mean, this is really. Like say for instance bishop d2 does she challenge immediately in the center with c5 again she has to be ready for all the complications that's going to be involved there with the opening of the d line does she perhaps play it a little bit more solidly with queen c7 i mean again she has to navigate this and where she, is uh, ju wan jung going to put the king to a familiar caro player i mean they will know but to someone trying this out for the first time, it might not necessarily be apparent because if you castle kingside, well then white still has a ready-made attack of putting the knight on e4, g4, g5 is coming your way. And also, let's not forget f4s and also let's not forget p sacrifices on h6. So which way are you uh, looking uh, to castle See, if you're with black? To be honest with you, I always really like the c5 lines. I'm, I like going queen b. I, I really do like going queen b6. This is an approach that I, I've, I'm a big fan of at times. But again, you have to well time it. Like queen b6, queen b5 is something that I love doing. Mm -hmm. uh, c5 is my big preference because I feel like c5 says to white, well, you're not your king. So, so for instance, play could really explode. So after castles, c takes d4 first of all you have to know you you have to be prepared to give up white for sure will win it and then you know just say well your king on c1 isn't gonna be so safe either that's that's kind of like my whole essence and then where possible i will put my king as quickly as i can to the king side and again say yes there's something happening on the king side but i will be quick down the c line you know, I'm not sure that Juvenjun uh, feels very comfortable right now. Mm. Well, I I was surprised, to be honest with you, that she, if we were to go all the way back to move four, I was surprised that she chose the bishop f5 line. Because this one is very theoretical. And yes, it's not really popular at the minute, but it is the first line that every kind of caro player no sorry every play every player for the white pieces they learn they learn all these kind of lines and i do remember sitting next next to harry krishna a long time ago and he was playing the caro Khan with the black pieces and he tried knight d7 <laughs> and i was like oh, okay this was an opening i used to play a long time ago and then just just so you just for everyone at home, this is like a public service announcement. If you meet Queenie 2 
<laughs> do not do not play 90F6 because oh no 96 will come with checkmate <laughs> I have also seen this happen like live on a tournament <laughs> and it was against the Rich, Richard Report <laughs> and Richard had the white pieces and you know he finished the game in like six moves and <laughs> off he goes and enjoys the rest of the day um, yeah this is not what well, you want this night D7 system was a big favorite of Anatoly Karpov he was playing mm. it against me quite a few occasions and of mm. course Bishop D3 is the main line as far as I remember yeah. and yeah very interesting line actually also became quite theoretical with time Knight F6 yeah. Knight G5 and stuff like that yeah, but I, I remember or, that Harry Krishna had it all worked out, blah, 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 and he beat an international master. He was about 24.50 at the time. That was easily with the black pieces. And I remember being very impressed by this game. So I just thought, okay, this was many, many years ago, but I, I did think that this one would would be the opening to catch Leiting J off guard. But no, that didn't happen. So I'm going to go back to the game position and Actually, we still you know see. you know what is interesting that uh juven john has a 20 minute uh behind mm -hmm. right now so this is kind of strange we are just what move six or seven yeah we're move 11. So but it's all theory like, right this is all theory i mean this has all been played before i mean it, it is surprising that Ju Wenjin gets into this position and she's using the time to work things out because unfortunately this particular line in the Karakhan you need to know probably up to move 17 but once you've mastered it okay then you start thinking and at least you don't have that many moves to make until move 40 and you get that a uh, half hour bonus time but yeah Queen E2 has been played and yeah Knight f6 is the main move i mean what could she be worried about what is stopping her from playing what is the most natural move on the board is she considering knight takes knight is she i mean like knight f6 it, it is i'm a little bit baffled so i'm just like looking at knight f6 bit Bishop d2, castles, yeah. bishop d2, this I think is bishop what? bishop e7, long castle, short castle, something like this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you don't, again. if you don't, if you haven't done your homework, for instance, and you don't want to be playing c5 because you're just thinking black doesn't have the time right now, then as you mentioned, bishop e7 is also very normal. And there white will certainly castle queenside and then castle queen c7 is a move what i found interesting in these systems a lot when i was uh, analyzing it with uh, uh, with some trainers partners that when you have your pawn on h4 or h5 it can give a huge difference in some cases because, mm -hmm. of course, uh, when the bishop on g6, many times, of course, we have this line, h5, bishop h7, bishop d3, that's the way to exchange. And not having the pawn on h5, it can give extra opportunities for white time to time to have the knight on h5, in some cases, or what it can give extra uh, plus for white, also if once, let's say, white goes knight e4, or even in some uh, rare occasions, white goes knight f1, knight e3 or something, but mainly when you start to play g4, once you have your pawn on h4, g5 can be much more powerful. Yeah, the knight gets out of his own way, definitely. Yeah, definitely a, a big idea in this line. And also one thing I wanted to say is that with the pawn on h4, there's also the benefit that should black react quickly with c5, that in the end games, this, uh, this rook is not tied down to the defense of this h5 pawn. <laughs> that looks like a really no, small it, thing, but it is a huge thing, especially for Black's counter chances. And now we do see Knight F6 on the board, so we could be seeing this position on the board. 
and yeah I, I, and and uh, there we see ah wow. Leighton J castling very quickly so she says no she doesn't want to go into these very sharp opposite side castling positions and instead you see she wants to go very solid but when yeah. you pawn on h4, it's not the most obvious continuation to go solid. I mean, this way, the pawn on h4 can be vulnerable. But, uh, yeah, I mean, why is playing very solid? Don't you think so? Yeah, I'm... Um, uh, okay, that's... <laughs> no, I mean, castles. Castles, I'm just wondering whether it can transpose into... Because uh, immediately, as the, uh, the Caro player kicks in and says, well, I don't have to be worried of the lines that you were talking about getting pawn stormed and on the king's side. And there we see Ju Wanjun simply develop the dark squared bishop, bishop e7. I think also Ju Wanjun, judging by her pace, will be relieved to see castles on the board as well. I mean, what is uh, Leighton J's idea? Rook to d1? Interesting that she plays so fast. Yeah, but uh, but one of the things that we have seen from Lady J is that she has played remarkably quickly in the opening stages. She's also played very confidently, and she seems to have quite a few lines worked out. And I realise that I'm saying it in a very British way, which means she has, seems to have a lot of things worked out. <laughs> Rick to d1 on the board because the fact that she's playing so quickly, queen c7, I would expect castles. I think I would castle the king. I mean, you have to be a, there's no sacrifices on the board. Yeah, and sure, uh, castle is on the board. Okay. And c4 played. I mean, this is normal for Lei to play this fast? I mean, they, she's blitzing, practically. She is blitzing. And she's making... Sometimes, she's sometimes making... it can show the. this is how she wants to cover her nervousness. Right, yeah, that, that, that definitely could be a thing. And uh, she did say at the press conference that 50% uh, of what she's saying is the truth. <laughs> That's what she said? <laughs> yes. She, in the press conferences, she comes across as very confident, <laughs> like <laughs> everything is good. And then they asked her, you know, how, how truthful are you both being in the in the press conferences? And Ju Wenjin, <laughs> you know, what you see is what you get. She said she tells the truth 99.9% .9 of the time. And Lei Ting Jay pauses and gives a smile and says, 50%. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so this could be bluff. I mean, she's playing moves like C4, which are very committal moves. And if everyone at home might be going, what are you on about, Ivanka? Like, how could C2, C4 be a committal move? And the point is that eventually the D4 pawn in an endgame could be very weak. I mean, black has is the one with uh, control or has the use of this semi-open line. And also you can get chipped away at the right time. This is everything is done at the right time with like B7, B5 ideas. I remember when I was first shown this idea, I was like, whoa, what is that? <laughs> but it's certainly a positional idea. Also other ideas, positional ones that are black can have at their disposal is like A5, A4, and then B7, B5. Ultimately, it's all going to be about pressure against this D4 pawn. But uh, that's the long game. And uh, when it comes to the short terms, well, I think this is the perfect time to take our first break. We did see Ju Wenjun launching the first surprise by playing the Karakan for the first time in this match. And we are going to leave the players there in Chongqing in the playing venue just for a short while. And we will take a break and return in a few minutes to the amazing city of Chongqing.
Your subscription makes shows like Your subscription makes shows like this possible, which is why our Twitch subscribers will never see ads on chess.com. Connect your chess.com account and Twitch account at go.chess.com slash connect accounts and bang, boom, voila, you're done. 100% ad-free bliss forevermore. Whether you're following our events on site or on stream, type the command connect in the chat and thank you for helping bring these shows to life. Oh my goodness, 98? Whoa. Bishop P5 with no me. No way! Oh, has to give it a me, 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 me! You blew me! The chance, rook F7. Oh, whoa, no! 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 Hello everyone and we are back to the mountain city Chongqing in China. It is the city that never sleeps, that comes alive. Uh, you can see these glorious lights and the nighttime. And talking about action, talking about thrills and spills, well we are right now in game seven of the women's world championship match and there we see reigning three-time women's world champion Ju Wenjun. She is trailing the challenger Lei Tingjie by a point and we are going to dive in to the action and after Lei Tingjie very confident opening even though she was ultimately surprised by Ju Wenjun's Karakhan nothing seems to have faced her and we see Ju Wenjun now in deep thought after 
Mating jays, C2, C4. Do well, it. I think it's, Sorry. I think it's very interesting, the speed, how uh, Lighting G is playing. And I think it can be also kind of confusing for Juve and June. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the main thing is what is confusing is that uh, she's not an expert in Karakan, to say the least, right? And so yeah. when you play an opening where you're not so familiar with every detail, but you prepare, you know what you're going to be playing in the first 10, 15 moves possibly. I mean, you can get okay, but still you have this mixed feelings that, oh, what should I do? Should I play bishop d6, queen c7, a5, queen b6, can I go c5? You know that the position is just kind of uh, very healthy. It's, it's a, starting to be a middle game position where the better wins, who understands the game, the position, the details, the inside and out. Uh, that is the person who is going to be uh, scoring uh, the full point or at least trying to press. This is a position where with white you should be just fine. I mean, you can... But I would not necessarily advise to play f4. That's for sure that you have to think about it five times whether you're going to play ever f4 in this position, having the king on g1 and having your specifically your pawn on h4 because this h4 pawn can be extremely tricky what will happen to it in a later stage of the game. But, uh, I mean, the game is getting into the extra tension uh, middle game. At the same time, it seems the time element will uh, take a big role in the game also. Yeah, because <laughs> once again, and we've been here before, Jude, many times, Ju and Jun, she is under one hour. Leiting J, well, she's got more time than she started off with. And like you say, that will have an impact later on in the game. And uh, Ju Wen Jun at the crossroads, as you've indicated, lots of plans. You can step the queen, connect the rooks. And which pawn and break do you go for? Do you expand with a7, a5? Do you ultimately play c5? Or do you even play to go bishop d6 and destabilize the knight on e5? And there we see queen a5. Well, that was not a move that was on my radar, but it is Just an when... idea in, in other yeah. lines. Well, basically, queen a5 can be also a sensible uh, move, of course, to bring out the queen uh, and connect the rooks, and possibly to go rook d8, rook c8, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, but b5, for example, is not a, not a move that black is preparing yet, and that is mm -hmm. one of the main plans, unless you're going to be going rook fc8. But... Um, yeah, yeah now B5 white's... happens at the end. B5 happens after you've completed development. You're not, un not under any da uh, danger, danger at all. It just happens, you know, say the queen of C7, some knights have been traded, and you're like, okay, well, how can I chip away? B5. The plan can be also queen A6 at some point, of course. That can be a very interesting and nice spot for the queen. At the same time, black will have to be careful that the queen is not going to be too much outside of the game. Because let's say if white goes bishop f4, which is a logical continuation now, and black goes queen a6 <coughs> with an idea to play b5 possibly and also to give this pin, uh, maybe queen d2 and bishop h6. I would be trying to think of these kind of tricky ideas. <laughs> <laughs> give, uh, g give some problem to the black and I think uh, this can be in a style of uh, lighting G as well but it's just an idea that uh, bishop f4, queen e3 or queen d2 with an idea to attack on h6 kind of uh, sacrificing can be an idea especially when the queen is so much far away yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I would be like you quite nervous about putting the queen on a6 just as you've indicated because of those ideas of you know building up and attack the king is all alone i i wouldn't like that at all and um bishop f4 is very natural but if what is the point of queen a5 i wonder whether queen a5 was just to provoke bishop d2 maybe she wants to go rook d8 because after rook d8 already you you would want rook fd8 let's say or uh -huh. rook ad8 but for some reason somehow I prefer rook uh, fd8, 
Though knight g6 can be sometimes a move that has to be considered all the time, but I see that uh, I don't think it, it works right now. But the idea after rook d8 is to capture on e5 and uh, to, to eliminate that very active uh, knight on e5. And if d takes e5, then already the queen on a5 stands extremely powerful. Yeah. And after knight d7, the bishop attacks the pawn on h4. Uh, also, the bishop is actually standing quite well and uh, powerful on the other diagonal. After d takes e5, bishop c5 can show up at some point. So well, say, for instance, not... you make a move like a3. I'm just suggesting it. That's the random move. Knight takes e5. and uh... Yeah, and basically if d takes e5, I would go knight d7. The h4 pawn is hanging. At the same time, knight h5 is there all the time. This uh, we touched already. This idea that as the pawn is not on h5 yet, the knight can show up uh, and attack playing queen g4, bishop h6, and stuff like that. Yeah, and I just highlighted the e5 pawn because I have a general rule of thumb. Okay, you have to know your rules in order to break them, but when a pawn stands on e5, it cuts the board in half, and this is a signal for you that you should where possible attack the king when a pawn stands on d5 the idea is not to attack on the queen side the idea is actually to grab as much space as possible so once again mm -hmm. i'm very happy to see that pawn on e5 fulfills my criteria <laughs> 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 one of these days i might write a little rule book on chess <laughs> and one and i will have it i will finish it once you know the rules go out there and break them <laughs> And yeah. basically, it's the first time when uh, Leiting G starts thinking a bit in this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Queen A5 clearly coming as a surprise to her. And okay, the more I look at it, because so Queen A5, the more I look at it, the more I like it, just because of this knight takes knight angle and then um, take control. Queen does stand okay on A5. I mean, are there any other moves that she could be considering? Bishop f4 looks like the most natural move. It's direct. It's very well, much in keeping with Leiting J style. Yeah, okay. Bishop f4 is the most logical, I believe. But also a3 or or also possibly b3 and bishop b2. Though that is extremely solid. Because I would like to... I would prefer to have the bishop on f4 and stay in the c1, h6 diagonal just for uh, mainly for tactical uh, reasons and opportunities to keep an eye on the h6 yeah. yeah yeah but of course after b3 you can go slow, solid rook d8 which rook this is the eternal question i don't know the answer to it <laughs> rook f to d8 feels of like you're neglecting the king yeah, after queen a5, also rook a d8 makes a lot of sense because probably after queen a5, you are not going to have this plan of playing a5. Mm -hmm. So rook to d8, other one to e8, just to make uh, sure that on the on e6 uh, there is not some extra things going to happen. Yeah, and still keep keep this idea that knight e5 is in there, or to play c5. Though c5 is uh, is kind of tricky because most of the, let's say bishop b2 and c5 uh, most likely will not really work for black because of d5. Yes, it's uh, definitely not something that you want to do because after pawn takes pawn, you're going to get into trouble. Ooh, knight f5. Anyway. Uh, I, I remember see, games like this. This with is Jogova. the square f5 which you don't want to give up in these positions because knight on f5 is a killer yeah and uh, it's hitting the bishop coming towards the g7 pawn nope it's game over there so you do not want that so so yeah this I kind agree. of c5 moves uh, black has to be extremely careful when to choose to play it most often if white can go push it uh, to d5 after c5 mm -hmm. c5 will not be a good move yeah, so if you can meet c5 with d5, then yeah, that's a very good rule of thumb here. And the bishop is on b2, so I, like, I'm just looking at moves like bishop a3. Because in general, in this type of structure, black is saying it's going to be all about the d4 pawn. You know, it's a simple position in that respect. 
And so I was immediately, you know, that the bishop is on b2. I'm attracted to moves like bishop a3. And borrowing also and I from think, ideas in the Slav playbook. I think we can say it's the best move, bishop a3. Just eliminate this, the black square bishop and then probably the position is just going to be equal. There's mm -hmm. not going to be much at all for white to be playing for. Yeah. And Unless some concrete ideas. Yeah, it, the, the only concrete line that I can think of is also knight takes knight. And, um, but then... Well, after knight takes knight, rook takes uh, knight. And once you exchange the, the bishop and you can have your doubling the rook on the d5, mm -hmm. actually black is not worse at all, putting pressure yeah. on the d4 pawn, right? Mm -hmm. So b3 is not something I would uh, like to play with white. Okay. So, the most natural move, we've come to the inclusion, bishop f4 is probably the best. Just supports the knight and, and reinforces. So, well, and develops. And exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you can't Which ask for more than that. <laughs> Which is not the last thing that uh, white should be doing, right? Right. And so, the rook will come to d8. I don't know which rook, so I'm just literally choosing one. And because we went for rook after d8, I was like, okay. <laughs> well, you know, there are some positions, and I think in these kind of positions, is it's a very huge dilemma. And it's one of the biggest thing. If you can, you know where to put your rooks, because the thing is that rook d8 with playing with the f rook or the a rook, it looks the same because it has the same purpose, right? To control and put the, the one of your rooks to the to the semi-open file on the d5 but you will figure out and you get to know only in 10 15 20 moves later whether you should have been playing with the other one and these are the small details which you <laughs> have to understand and know in uh, in the openings you're playing that where it belongs that rook right yeah completely and i mean I, even I haven't mastered this and I've been playing the Karakhan for most of my life. You know, I, I really don't know when is the best one because sometimes you want the A rook just to support A, A5, A4. Sometimes if you move the rook, F rook, then like you say, 10 moves down the line, there's an attack coming your way and you should have covered the F7 square. Um, yeah, so, or it could be also the reverse. If you move the A rook into the center, then the F rook is in the way of the king so it's it's very very complicated and you only kind of come to the conclusion just by feeling your way through them just by playing this position up many many times but rick f to d8 we see bishop f4 planned. on the board it is on the board our yeah, prediction so game is on yeah so after rook f d8 the main issue can be for there's two things that First of all, you're not going to have your other rook on e8. Secondly, you have to watch after the f7 pawn all the time. And we have rook a d8, I think. That's what she played. So she did not want to okay. give the weakness or give the alternative for white to attack some sometime sacrificing knight f7 or knight g6. Which is, which is again, very, very natural. Rook f to d8 felt provocative, but uh, at the same time, one one thing I just also wanted to point out: sometimes it looks like knight g6 is very dangerous, but black isn't necessarily obliged to capture that knight, and rook e8 can be a possibility to get out of those ideas. Yeah, but, but for now, question. Sorry, for yeah, now, for now I, it doesn't work. I, it doesn't work, and I don't see whether it ever will work in this game because. Somehow it seems that uh, black is very active and very well developed already. Yeah. So definitely not going to work here, but definitely something to always consider in this pawn structure. Have it in your memory banks. And okay, so now it's white's turn and uh, late J again, very aggressive, very direct style. And I remember this nice interview that uh, the women's the Chinese women's team captain, Ni Hua, did. And he was saying that Lei Ting Jie's style is very much aggressive. And Ju Wen Jun's is positional. And he called it a battle between the sword and the shield. So 
bearing that in mind, I'm thinking of aggressive moves. So I was thinking rook d3, <laughs> just to get the roving rook. Um, what else? I mean, I suggested some random move, a3, again, because I, I've had this done to me many times, a3 with the idea of b4 and steam roller at the black position. Um, what else is there? Well, I think I rook d3. I think rook d3 uh, is interesting move, and uh, but first of all, I don't know what is your plan because you cannot go rook d1 in the next uh, move because the a2 is under attack and can be taken. Just... The question is the first question I would ask, of course, after rook d3. What happens if I just simplify with knight takes e5? Mm -hmm. I and... would have to take with a bishop. Well, it's a question with bishop. what are you taking, but let's say bishop e5, and if I can go simply knight d7, attacking the h4 pawn. Also, I want to, of course, grab your bishop. Can you take on g7 or not? If not, then I think black is just super fine. Mm. I didn't know I was just... Uh... I was going to retreat my bishop in shame. Uh, <laughs> that was all I was planning. No, I mean, I don't think... Can you take? No, I don't I think mean, so, because after I grabbing don't think takes, so. knight h5, you simply go to h7 or h8, and uh, white will not have enough attack. Yeah, but in so that I case... Put it up. And then king goes king to h7. King h7, or even king h8, because now the a5 queen is standing very well also controlling the fifth rank so the white queen cannot go to e3 because the h5 knight would mm. be attacked yeah no 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 this was too much i'm, I'm not gonna do this to but in that case the after, position after knight e5 you have to capture it back with the pawn yeah but then there's there's this i would this take idea on d3. unless i would take on d3 he as well and then up. after and after e takes f6? I don't know. I haven't thought of that far. <laughs> so I can't take the calculation. Um, root takes rook, so I can actually move my bishop, right? I can go, as long as I take, I can go bishop d6. Well, bishop d6, queen d3, bishop f4, you take on g7. And rook d8. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Don't don't capture this uh, pawn on g7, because the pawn on g7 is a fantastic defensive piece for black, not for. <laughs> yeah, well, eventually it will be taken off when yeah. the queens are off, but black is doing fine. So I believe that rook d3, due to this very concrete, straightforward reaction by black capturing on e5, it will not work. Mm hmm. And from now well, on, in that I case, yeah, yeah, but no, because if rook d3 doesn't work and it didn't have a plan, I I can always take back. This is one of the benefits of doing commentary and go for the a3, a3, b4 plan. <laughs> I will swarm you on the queen side. Yes, a3 is very sensible, I believe. A3. Three. But you know now I'm thinking of playing also queen a4. Mm -hmm. And if I just carry on, obviously I, I didn't quite know where you're going. That's to another level for me, so I'm going to go b4. I don't know if I can go a5. Ah, that was the plan. <laughs> A rook, rook d, wow. And rook d three is on the d three played. I only suggested that because she is a very direct player, and we've seen her time and time again always choose the most aggressive path to an attack. Rook d three on the board and. Uh, that one had been neutralized because of knight takes knight. But I guess you have to also spot that after pawn takes knight, rook takes d3 will be met by... Hang on, so let's let's uh, let's uh, repeat this. So just, uh, just go to the analysis board again and 
just see after pawn takes knight, you have to be able to spot that after rook takes, pawn takes, that you do have bishop d6. That's the only move to stay alive in the game. And if late j misses that, which you might do, I don't know how easy is it to see, because we're, we're looking at it like literally on board. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, hang on a second, the plot thickens because after bishop d6, we've been uh, bishop just h6. been told bishop h6 is mm, interesting. Yeah. Looks scary to me. You have to move your rook, right? Yeah, but somehow I don't feel like to give you this opportunity to have your bishop on g7. Yes. Yes. So, so you're looking at pawn takes bishop, but if... Or bishop takes knight? But that never... Uh, but the thing is, though, if the bishop is allowed to live, just to... If you want to get rid of the bishop, you have to leave this pawn on f6. So, yeah, I don't know what. So life rook can... takes. Hmm. Hmm. Ninety five. Things are speeding up. Okay. Well, this position is uh, certainly. But interesting. also, should we go back? Yes, mm -hmm. because also after d takes e five, I think knight d seven is something to check on. Yeah, just to say no, thank you. These complications are not for me, but wait, wait one second. This then but everything knight makes H5. sense. Knight, knight H5, H5 that you, you've been talking about that for a long time. Yeah, so for example, and if in this position, pawn would be on H5, it would be a completely different story. This, this gives extra opportunities for white. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, rook D3 makes a lot of sense because it can show up on G3, which is very annoying for black. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Knight takes e5 on the board and it's decision time. So we really, so hang on a second, just by deep diving it, we should really deep dive into that bishop h6 variation because we will, could well see that happening. So knight takes e5, d takes e5, you have to go rook takes rook. Rook d3. And then this is where white gets all fancy and goes pawn takes knight. And after bishop, I don't, I don't see any other move other than bishop d6. No, bishop d6 is forced. Bishop h6 gets the interesting evaluation. And now, like d5 on the board. Pawn. It is on the board. Okay. And somehow other, because we're, we're a few moves ahead of them, I don't know whether to kind of go back to the live board and just watch their faces or, or kind of like try to analyze out this position. What do you think, Judith? Should we try to get to the grips with this one? No, I think we should th try to figure out what black can do here. This, this bar yeah. on this side is very confusing, that it shows that black is fine and I don't see why is it so good for black. Actually, I don't see well, the next move of black. Okay, so we get rook takes knight. That's one one move. Okay, so but if rook takes knight, pawn takes uh, rook, and still nothing yeah, changes in regard that black cannot take on h6. And there's also bishop takes. I'm I'm just I'm doing the whole CCT. Like these yeah. are the options. Bishop takes, and there's also rook d4 with the idea of rook to h4, and getting out of there and just being ice cold and say or maybe if yeah so if you're ice cold let's go rook d4 and let's just be like okay you bishop know what? g7 and maybe bishop I'm g7 just rook d8 and you look exactly at, look at that queen on a5 look at that gives what a powerful defense on the fifth rank if it would mm -hmm. not be there queen h5 and game over right exactly and this rook on d4 covers the g4 square so there's no dangerous stuff happening 
Well, it's it's becoming very interesting this game. Hmm. So maybe not. You know, there is a very interesting line. What do you think about? Ooh. Oh, but wait one second, because this is no. What I wanted to say, what I wanted to say, just to point out. Sorry, I'm just excited yeah. about it. If uh, yeah. after d takes e5, rook d3. No, after ef, after yeah. uh, rook d3, queen takes d3. Yeah. Because rook d8 is not possible now because of ef6. Nice one. And then Greg takes queen. Yeah. You take the bishop and that pawn cannot be, be stopped. stopped and it will become a new queen. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but this means, that's an, this means that my question is that uh, maybe that's why rook d3 was not good. Because not ef6, yeah. but queen takes d3 was the, the good move reaction. Because of rook d8, not possible. Ah, uh, yeah. That's... That's a very important. That's a very important point. So the queen takes d three, rook d eight, not possible. And knight d seven is not possible. So and after knight g four, queen e two back. So in yeah, this case, uh, but I don't like yeah, knight don't on h seven. Well, now if we go back to the position, because we've had a few moves, rook d3 played, knight takes knight, as we predicted, pawn takes knight, excellent move from Lady Ting J. And now, no rook takes rook, but knight to h7. So white, well, basically it's still a matter has of the hallmarks of the attack. Sorry. It's a matter of one move, right? If the knight would be on h5 already and white has the time to play rook g3, game would be over for black. Mm -hmm. But after knight h5, black is capturing on d3 with the exchange. Knight that on is h7. True. Knight on h7 looks like a tricky one. At the same time, the h4 is hanging. And white does not want to push h5, that's for sure. But if, and can you sidestep? Because ultimately, I feel that this pawn on h4, it's hanging, as you mentioned. This well, is now, now the question is whether is white going to give up a pawn in one way or another? Because h4 is hanging. The d5 you might have to give up, and that's not uh, something white wants. Hmm. Because now it can be very tricky for white. But you can use both sides of the board. So for instance, you can go rook b3. Because I, I really don't want to trade off rooks. I feel that this is the perfect attacker in disguise. You, and I was wondering about moves like rook b3. I was even looking at b4. Just to get that time to go knight h5. Knight h5. Rook b3. And then... After bishop takes h4, the plan is then to point at the b7 pawn. Yeah, but you know, when you give up the, the d file, it can be very tricky. And also, okay, of course, knight h5 seems uh, that it's, it can be dangerous for black. But at the same time, maybe there is nothing. For example, let's say we go rook b3. What happens okay. if with black, I just don't do anything else, just go rook d7, you know? Because if once I would uh, control the sev the d file, I mean you go knight h five. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, but I'm just wondering whether you can be really bold and go. Uh, that's I'm what I would take do. Take this one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Take that one off the board and say, you know what? I got the g five square. Yeah. Okay. So let's rewind my rook to b three and let's have a look again. Let's go back to the drawing board. Knight h7. I think white has to be very careful what uh, her choice will be. Knight e4 is something to consider. It, it looks a very logical and very appealing move. Two words to d6. Mm -hmm. Knight e4. So after bishop h4, I think I would be going rook h3, and it looks very appealing. 
extremely the dangerous history. for black. It does look very dangerous because if I just drop the bishop back, then you don't need to be asked twice, right? Are you going to be sacrificing or are you going to? Come I in don't with know. Queen? I don't know because I'm afraid if I go bishop h6, you just you can go immediately queen e5, but maybe you can even capture it first. But maybe knight queen e5 immediately is the mm. is uh, the best reaction. Yeah. So the question is, after bishop h4, can you do something else? Or uh, like just the position upon sacrifice that if you go back, rook, bishop h4, the knight d6. Mm -hmm. Because I like my knight on d6 very much. It's a nuisance piece and this extra pawn isn't worth that much, so what to do? So I think knight e4 is uh, critical. Yeah. And if you think about you it, know, that's the only piece which is not playing well. That is true. That is a very true. And it also makes me think that after knight e4, Maybe black should be looking at playing like rook takes rook first. Mm -hmm. Takes back. Takes back. And now I just, I'm very nervous with your rook on d3. I'm, you know, they were always taught that three is the, the number <laughs> to attack a king with. It's the magical number and I'd like to get rid of one of them. Okay, knight d6. 96 and now is the time for me to say a pawn is a pawn is a pawn and move my queen back i don't know move the queen back i, I, I don't know just it's not very it's not aggressive but then doesn't matter but then you could solidify as well with maybe i should be going back with bishop e3 because i don't want i don't want to exchange your bishop if you go bishop g5 Mm -hmm. Do I fully think that uh, white has uh, great compensation having the knight on d6? I mean, I'm happy to give up one pawn for something like that. Yeah, no, I mean, it feels like this pawn on h4 is just irrelevant. And it's going to be all about the action happening in the middle of the board. Yeah, definitely not a pleasant position for black. Well, I think I would definitely, I would definitely go knight e4. Mm -hmm. Because I'm afraid knight h5 kind of things simply don't work. Yeah. But it's so pretty, knight h5. <laughs> Trust me, I have the temptation. Trust me, I have the temptation to go there. And after all, it's not my game, so why not to play knight h5? Yeah, <laughs> but knight e4 makes perfect sense, you know. I, but I must admit, my eyes was drawn to knight h5, and, of course, and if, it's if like, you, I can't help it. If you play with black, that's the first thing you have to be uh, looking at. Because if after knight h5, your king is in trouble, then there is, uh, there is no way out. So that's the first thing you have to think about. But knight e4 after d takes e5, and what an outpost for the knight on d6, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but it becomes a, a positional sacrifice. Yeah, and uh, well, these days with Alpha Zero, you know, showing us all that positional sacrifices are nothing to be feared. It's all about space. It's all about gaining control. Then I think that Leighton J will find Knight E4, and big, big moment here. Knight E4 seems to promise White a very good position at the same time Whereas, it's a pawn sacrifice right so you're plus up uh, on the match and these are the very very difficult moments and decision yeah. to be make in such a, a match situation because of course if it would be 50 percent like equal nobody's leading then you go 94 if if you're behind you go 94 but it's so difficult when you you have the lead 
basically it's the opportunity of his life, right? He, she can become a world champion. She doesn't want to miss this opportunity. And then the pressure, it can be really on your shoulder that uh, every decision you make. So if it's in back of your mind, this is a big question, how much you can eliminate this uh, sensation during the game. And can yeah. you focus and be in the game only and not to think about all these things? Yeah, that is a big issue. And I just saw a question there from chat and uh, I would just like to answer the question first because it's also very relevant. So we were looking at moves like um, Rick takes Rick, no, 987, 94, big move. And uh, maybe this can happen. And then, then Bishop takes h4 and knight d7. And we kind of, we saw kind of situations like this and you wanted to drop the bishop back. And the big question from chat was, you know, can the bishop just simply not capture the knight and uh, just remove this piece? Well, I guess I would like to go either b4 to start with or rook d1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Maybe the problem B4. is, is that you do get rid of the knight on d6, but you replace it with something which can be potentially even worse, which could be a protected pass pawn sitting there on d6, two squares away from queening. So it's, you know, yes, sometimes it can be the best decision on the board to capture that knight. Other times I would be very, very wary about it. And I would only advocate it if, for instance, black had some kind of control over the c5 square. Better to let that knight stay there, sit pretty on d6, and then black simply holds. You know, for black is all about just being tight, and just not allowing white any opportunity to infiltrate the position. And uh, going back to your point about uh, mental resilience, you know, you were talking about these are the kind of moments where you have to have the focus. And you mentioned that for the world, for your world championship match, uh, you were training on this. I mean, how does one train their resilience? Oh, that's a very tough uh, question. Basically, I think it's it's uh, something uh, to be resilient in the tournament. It's a matter of mm -hmm. experience, mostly. Because uh, okay. when you have a tournament and things are going your way, you're experiencing that uh, uh, what can you do accordingly what kind of form you are and how you play but also you have to experience and learn about yourself how you're dealing with difficult moments and how do you bump back yeah in in those that's, cases because this is the I, question also for Ju, juven june that can she play just ignoring the match situation mm -hmm. well she's actually been in that situation before She's uh, in the match against uh, Goryashkina. She was down by one point and she responded by winning two games in a row. So Ju has that experience, but she has never had the experience of not winning a game. She's always gone through the second half and there's always been one victory here or there. And now she's meeting an opponent who's very well prepared. She hasn't been able to break through. And now we see dramatic switches like for instance changing opening and it's it's kind of but the thing is with experience um, and developing resilience is that you have to place yourself in those kind of situations and <laughs> you can't keep placing yourself in world championship matches most of, for most of us it might be just like that one shot Yes, but Juven Jun has the, that experience, mm -hmm. right? So this is, uh, yeah. for this reason, she has an advantage in that. Yeah. And, well, we will see. This position will certainly require the players to be focused, to show their grit, their resilience, their ability to pivot if needed. And it's the perfect time to head towards a break. But this Monday something amazing is gonna be happening because it is the bullet chess championship where 16 of the world's greatest speed chess players will contend for the bullet chess 
the crown. Will Hikaru defend his reign? Will Ferruja block his path and take back the title he held just two years ago? Will Magnus's bullet championship chess championship debut shake up the field entirely? Submit your bullet chess championship bracket now for the chance to win six months of diamond membership. Use exclamation point fantasy in chat. Bracket submissions close on July 17th when game one of the Bullet Chess Championship kicks off. And with that, we're going to leave the players for a while, but don't go anywhere because the action will continue right after this break. Yeah, there are, there are a few. I mean, one for sure is interviewing the Holocaust survivor and 1956 French women's chess champion, Isabel Schoko. Started out as a podcast for ladies night in the grid and it turned out that i got a chance to travel to paris and actually meet isabel herself that's a, a little piece that's going to be coming out on chess.com soon oh, that was just magical i mean i'm jewish and you know seeing the rise of anti-semitism is is really disturbing and to be able to talk to somebody who was almost slaughtered in one of the worst atrocities of all time but is still living 80 years later and really not just living, but thriving, like providing so much inspiration to everyone around the world. I mean, it's a magical moment. Like this is like one of the reasons why we play chess and why we create art for moments like that. So I feel uh, really lucky to have met Isabel and thankful for that. Also, another moment that really stands out for me was when Yuda Polgar uh, visited my US Chess Girls Club. We had hundreds of girls there from all over the world. In fact, we had girls from Kenya, we had girls from, you know, obviously the United States, from Colombia, and we also had adult women there as well. Um, so it was a huge turnout and Judith was just so charming and brilliant in her answers. In particular, I noticed that a lot of girls asked her similar questions on a variation of like, what do you do if your confidence is shattered? What do you do if you lose a few games in a row? If you're scared, you don't know what to do. And it's funny because Judith's like reply was so striking to me because she was just like, oh man, this, these questions are tough for me because I've always been so confident. And uh, she did manage to reply, but it was interesting to me to see that that was a bit of a struggle for her because she has always had that confidence that she was great. She hasn't suffered from imposter syndrome. And I think that's a big secret to her success and just a reminder of how important confidence is to becoming um, the best chess player that you can be. We're just waiting on Lay's choice here. Oh no! Oh she didn't God, play she that! Did Come on. 
kudos to Lei Tingjie for a really, really impressive performance. Lei Tingjie has won this match. Huge congratulations. What a performance. Great games. And that's it. Resignation. That's oh, wow. it. Lei Tingjie, the winner of the 2023 candidates. Finals. Congratulations to Lei Tingji and her supporters. Challenger Lei Tingji is trying to become the. Hello and welcome back. And there we did see the way that Lei Tingji found herself in Chongqing, her home city. Facing off against reigning three-time Women's World Champion Ji Wenjun for none other than that coveted crown. And there we see Ji Wen, sorry, Lei Ting Jae deep in thought. We are waiting on her decision. Is she tempted by a kingside attack? Is she perhaps willing to sacrifice a pawn in order to get a magnificent knight on D6? Well, Lei Ting Jae is thinking about everything and we see her there focused with full determination. And we have to remind ourselves of the dating Jay's journey. You know, it all started in 2021. China, of course, severely impacted by COVID. And uh, she only had one tournament that she could play in 2021. And she chose to play the Grand Swiss in Latvia. And she won it with a round to spare. And then, of course, in 2022, she again had only one tournament. That was the women's candidates. And she won that one convincingly. And in 2023, she faced off in the finals of the candidates against uh, her compatriot and also someone that she's grown up alongside, Tang Zhongyi. And she won that one as well <laughs> convincingly. She never needed a tie break for any of her matches. So there we can see her path. First of all, defeating Maria Mazichuk, and then she beat Anna Mazichuk, and then Tan Zhong Yi. Very remarkable player, and we've seen her just arrive to the board, just armed to the teeth with preparation. We know that she's working with Timur Rajabov as his as her second. And Judith, I mean, has uh, Rajabov actually worked as a second before? I think... Uh... Probably he did, but uh, I'm not very well aware of uh, in which matches mm -hmm. or to who. And yeah. uh, he's a very strong player, very uh, pretty good theoretician, I must say. And it's interesting for me to see that the ladies have very strong uh, team, probably. But at least what we know, the 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 leader of the the team of second it's uh, Rajabov and Hari Krishna on the other side for Juvin Jun, and I think it's very important yeah. for uh, not only for preparation but also from mindset side that I'm sure they put the the ladies in the mindset that they have to be focusing already from the very beginning in the opening to take the advantage take the lead take the initiative. And at the same time, of course, it must be a very difficult job for being a, a coach and second. Um, no. And the position what we have actually and the situation, seeing the faces, I think we can see on the body language a pretty big shift compared to a few moves ago when uh, Juven Jun was like sitting there thinking, even with simpler choices, she was spending quite some time, but it seems to me that now she finds herself and she feels kind of comfortable. Contrary to Teng uh, uh, Lei uh, Teng Ji, she kind of expressed on her face that she's not happy, that it's just not working. It's like, this is what the, what the expression I saw on her face, that mm, my attack will not work out. It's, it's not. And... And you know what? It's of course the position is balanced, and I think 94, 96 will have a great compensation for white. At the same time, if you have a different mindset and you think after Rook D3, she thought that 95 is not possible because she's going to be 
going with knight h5 or just she thought that knight e5 is not possible because what we were looking also that after captures is back rook d3 that was the only thing we were looking and maybe she saw this tactical which is very good in tactics so she saw this that rook d3 is not possible after queen d3 rook d8 because of this e takes f6 and f takes e7 tactical idea so it can happen that you simply underestimate a move like knight h7, which I think I would do, or I had this feeling, okay, if you have to go to knight h7, that's fine. I'm happy with my rook d3. And now you have to realize it, that actually it's not that simple at all, because you cannot go rook d1 because the a2 pawn is hanging and the h4 is hanging. I don't want to give up the d file. So this is again a moment where you have to show your resilience and be able to switch your plans and realize it also that after knight takes e5, d5, simply the whole structure changed and you have to have different ideas and look for new opportunities. What is the plus for white after having the pawn from d4 to e5? And the plus is that the d6 pawn is... Uh, is undermined there so yeah you have a big control over the d6 square as you said and but it does require some flexibility right because i'm pretty sure no relating j style that uh, this rook was primarily designed to move over to the g3 square the knight was going to come over to the h5 and it was going to be checkmate faster than you can say the word checkmate but no, instead, as you mentioned, that's very double-edged to play just on the king side because there are counter-attacking possibilities um, in the center. So, huge moment. And, I, uh, I also think that it's very important to, to show and talk about it. That just like three, four moves ago, uh, Lei had Which 20 point? minutes more. And now she's behind. She's four minutes less than Juven yeah. Jun. So these things uh, can be annoying and uh, you realize it that something is happening and some things have changed in the position and also clockwise and psychologically. Yeah. And there we see, because that, I have to go back to that position. After C4, I remember Leighton J had uh, used hardly any time on the clock and she had one hour and 31 minutes. She had more time than when she started. And then fast forward to knight h7, and we see that she has 50 minutes on the clock. But uh, are you surprised that Ju Wenjun has not really left the board and that she is also seated, seated there? But I think this thinking. is uh, I think this is more or less what's going on in this whole match, right? They're, they're yeah. sitting uh, at the board contrary to the match with the, uh, I remember when in Dubai, Carlson and Napo Miyachi was playing. <laughs> Basically, they were, especially Napo, but I think also uh, Carlson was simply most of his time in the relaxing or, or room where they had a screen to watch. But I think that was also a fact of the, the COVID where they used to the computer and screen so much that they felt at least as comfortable to see their game on the screen than at the board. But I rather see the players at the board because we can see the expressions, their body movement. And right. this gives a lot of information to us commentators, but also for the viewers, because this is part of the chess game. This is what we used to when we compete, that we feel the other one, we see the expressions, how they behave. And many times you can read a lot from their faces and we have 94 on the board. Yeah, you were spot on that night is heading to the d6 square late j has abandoned the h pawn to its fate and instead it's going to be a battle between control over the d line and black's extra material so this is going to be a very intriguing fight indeed and i'd like to whilst we're waiting for ju wanjun to re respond you know whether she will trade off rooks whether she will capture or whether she will f oops capture on h4 that arrow was a bit off kilter and uh, whether she will try to do that or she would just uh, try to control the d6 square but she cannot do that so I, th I suspect she will take the pawn some way or other and uh, going back to the seconds and going back to the world championship match and the preparations so have you, have you ever been a second 
well, uh, family second. <laughs> family second yeah because your sister Susan she of course was a women's world champion in 1996 yes she uh, beat Zijun uh, yeah was it Zijun or was Zijun. it Gal- Gal- yes. no, Zijun, no, Zijun yeah Zijun yeah. Zijun yeah my instincts were right and what was that like as a family as a second watching your sister play I mean how uh, and also tell us if you can if, <laughs> all the preparations that she did for that big encounter well, uh, basically, she had the first try on uh, uh, in '93 when she decided that okay, she wants to try to become women's world champion after all. And uh, but she was playing the at the same time her match with Yossiliane, then I was playing my match against Boris Paske in Budapest. Mm-hmm. And there, th- everything was so unfortunate for her in Monaco. She was leading the match, an eight-game match, four to two, and then she lost and lost another one, and it was a playoff, and and actually it was a lottery at the end. Yeah. And after that, I told her that well, if you want to try again, I'm going to help you. I'm going to to be with you if uh, if I can. And then she won a huge. Uh, uh, tournament in Tilburg she made the victory I was joining her and also I think my mother joined her so it was Psahis who was her trainer mainly and I was more of coaching on two directions of course I was part of uh, analyzing lines but moreover I think it was more important from the psychological and emotional aspect my support I was the one who was uh, accompanying her to the tournament and before the game to say those last few words that you can do it you're great be calm and uh, those important last seconds just before the game to to put her mindset and uh, and feelings into the right place and then i was joining her uh, to her match against chibur danitza in st petersburg and I remember very vividly when uh, when I met Asmai Parashvili, who was one of the seconds of Chipur Donitza at the time, and he was just shocked that what am I doing there? But actually, I got an invitation to Linares, and I cancelled that. And uh, they they were shocked that how is it possible that I was just uh, cancelling my participation? So that was a tough match, and and also uh, yeah, uh, we were training a lot and. Uh, but also the emotional part was very good and also it was good uh, that I was kind of frightening the the Chibu's uh, team that uh, we take it as seriously that I'm actually there and accompanying and supporting my sister and then the final match I was also there for the whole time and uh, mm-hmm. yeah those small things were important I think and I contributed but it was uh, it was great because Susan gave so much to me when I was growing up and supportive so I could I could give a little bit back to her to support her there. Uh, and what was it like as a second watching the games? And I'm also really curious to know like how you trained and again, the emotions before, during the game. Well, I think emotions is actually very important. Uh, and, and it was very big part of it, especially when she was already in the lead. Because I think that's the most difficult uh, to handle in some ways. Because when you know that you're out there at the at the battlefield, and you know that you're prepared, you're going to fight it out, you do your best. You have your strategy to simply fight. And you have to try to, to strike, right? But once you do that, then you have already new strategies come up. Uh, whether should you change anything? Should you be playing more solid? And the bottom line is always that you should be just playing the same way, not to take extra crazy risk. But I think those are the most difficult things to change, and especially when Susan had extra, I think she had already plus two or plus three in the match with uh, Xiju, and she was like uh, panicking at some moments that, you know, she was seeing ghosts on the free day, and then you, you should have to calm down. and Because it can be so emotional that you get so close and of course for her it was especially dangerous because she had a winning kind of match already against Yossiliane where she was leading four to two and she knew that she could ruin once such an important match 
And uh, so those things are, of course, uh, very important, but uh, at least as important as uh, what is the preparation uh, from chess point mm -hmm. of view. But the two together yeah. must be uh, must be done uh, continuously, changing, alternating. And of course, the other most important thing is in a match and in such a tense situation that when you're not preparing, when you're not focusing on the game and playing the game, how can you take relaxed moments? And those walkings and, and shoppings on the free day, <laughs> shoe <laughs> shoppings, that was also part of the positive preparation for the match <laughs> or in between games. <laughs> and no, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. I, mean, I know exactly what you're talking about. I because, mean, guys, you know, probably they mostly go simply for a huge walk around the city for the... 355th time on the same route but uh, for me it was also kind of a great preparation when in, on the free day or sometime when I want to relax or change that I just go looking around shopping that really takes away my mind completely from the action what's going on in the tournament but we have action on the board we Lots do have action. action. We have uh, in in the, we actually have predicted nearly everything. So uh, the knight did come to e4, as we saw, and then we did see Ju uh, Wen Jun decide to trade off rooks and uh, grab the pawn indeed. And after Leighton J put the knight on d6, completely expected. The queen didn't retreat to c7, which is just the move that I suggested. But queen did come to b6. And we are going to see this position. So the queen on b6 does threaten the pawn on b2, and it also threatens the pawn on f2, because this bishop on h4, don't forget it, it is hiding away, but it is playing a role. I like queen b6, to be honest, and generally I like those moves, which has several uh, different ideas, and actually it has three, right? What you just mentioned, attacking the b2 and f2, at the same time defending her own pawn on b7. So it is kind of a nice spot for the queen. But now the question is whether what uh, white is going to be playing. Is she going to play queen d2, defending both of the pawns? And also I have my own stuff. Just take a look a little on the right side. And bishop h6 uh, one day can, uh, can be something to consider. So queen d2 is something I would... Uh, think first yeah. I I was thinking Queen d2 as well that was my first reaction but then you know because I'm just a commentator and when I'm commentating I feel like I can be as extravagant as I like but also because someone did this once to me and it was very painful and uh, they they just gave away the b pawn in return they got the b7 pawn and yeah they just killed me on the seventh row so i was thinking that if you can defend the f2 point and you have to cover the e5 point so the move i really wanted to play but doesn't work is to go bishop e3 yeah the problem with bishop queen b3 e3, that i captured e5 that's the yes problem. that is the big problem and that unfortunately is no good because the knight on d6 is no longer stable so that doesn't quite work but I, I was inspired by the idea and I thought okay well so if somehow or other I can manage to defend the f2 pawn g3 and, uh, is also g3 there was a that can be considered which uh, after probably bishop uh, g5 no, is she, the move she she plays queen e2 so keep it simple and there we see queen e2 on the board queen e2 maybe uh, she played because possibly she has a plan to play rook d1 and again bring the other rook to d3 to the third rank to h3 or to b3 which can be very powerful but I think queen d2 also made a lot of sense. But queen e2 is uh, is also something. Also queen g4 is uh, something she might be looking after at mm -hmm. some point. Yeah. Yes. It's certainly in the air. Also, also you, you can have uh, many kind of like, how, how to say this, 
they can have many appearances. Like for instance, you can go bishop e3 and then capture on h6. You can go bishop e3 just to chase the queen away. Queen is but I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. What do you do on queen d4? Well, you're going your to plan, go g3. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm going to go g3 because I, I, it took me about a few seconds, but I did notice that you had an idea that after rook d1, you could... No, rook d1 just gives up the bishop. Simple. Yeah, that was but my I idea. Go g3. <laughs> I was looking at bishop takes f2, but no, 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 g3. G3 and well, then after, rook d1. After g3, actually, you have no threat, though you have rook d1, but you're not threatening mm. g takes h4 at once. Can I go... Knight g5, or it's very stupid? Um, well, the evaluation part doesn't approve. Yeah, it doesn't like it so <laughs> much. I agree. Maybe and just simply king g2. King g2, and I'm just wondering, rook d, what is the plan after rook d3? Uh, you want to go knight h3. I wanted Try. knight h3 and take on f4, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I go king g2. Yes, I think that... That kills me. Okay, so after g3, if bishop g5... I guess... Rook d1. Yeah, But then I guess d1. you go queen c... Queen goes back to b6. Yeah. And the move I no. really want to play is is probably not the best move. I probably guess you have to go bishop takes bishop or... Yeah, that's what I was thinking, that simply bishop takes bishop, knight g5, and you go king g2, and after that f4, rook d3, and you have great initiative. It's, it's just simply nice to play it with white. Yeah. And once again, black's extra pawn is just there on h6. It doesn't have any, any impact on the game whatsoever, so... Material doesn't matter in this exact position. Yeah, it's it's looking difficult for Ju Wen Jun. So well, you know, I'm e2. thinking, I'm thinking with Black after Queen E two, whether uh, how to get out of this box with Black because I would like to have if I would have two moves, I would be happy to play C five and Queen C six. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I have time to reach my queen uh, with my queen to c6, you know? Because that, well, that would be quite okay. If I play c5, queen c6, b6, then all this yeah. kind of rook d1, rook d3, rook b3 does not make any sense anymore. Right. But okay, so what's stopping you? Can you not do it now, c5? I don't know if you're fast enough to play g3, for example. <clears throat> and a step back with the bishop. Though even even bishop e seven can be sensible, you know, right? Because uh, if I would have time, queen c six, rook d eight, I can uh, play takes even on d six, knight f eight, f six, e five. I understand that I'm kind of dreaming right now for black, but I just want to show that it's not that white just puts the knight on d six and nothing bad can yeah. happen to her. Exactly. And it's all about the protection and the control of the c5 square. Um, I like c5. I like it a lot. Um, but the question is, what is white doing? Is white going king g2? No, no, you can't go king g2, queen c6. Rook, rook d1. But maybe, maybe you shouldn't play g3, actually. Maybe after c5. Well, you can One go should... queen g4. No, you cannot go queen g4. No, no, no I was just thinking... Queen g4, just... bishop Inter... f2. Yeah, that was, that's why I wanted to introduce the rook to the game. Rook to d1. Okay, rook d1. Queen c6. Yeah. And now, now, now is the time where I do something fancy. I maybe bring my, my queen out to g4. And the evaluation part. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the judge on a like pop idol. <laughs> you make a but move you know, and it moves was, in one direction. 
I was also thinking to go back to e7 with the bishop in the previous move. Ah, okay. I guess instead of rick instead of queen c6, instead you just of queen go all the way c6, back. yeah. And mm -hmm. if you go queen g4, I'd be going uh, king h8. What else? Yeah. No, actually, after queen g4, I might be able to take on b2 because after bishop a6, queen e5. So, for example, that e5 pawn, if whatever circumstances, I mean, unless I have to give up a rook in, uh, in return, but if I can get the e5 pawn, that would be huge for black. Yeah, I, I have an I have an idea. I have an idea. So maybe not rook d1, but it's just it's just a cheapo, but it is a cheapo that I I liked. So after queen e2, you go c5. I was thinking bishop d e3. Oh no, the, no, no, no! I did not like it. I just what wanted is your to go cheapo b4. here. But you b4. know after. After bishop e3, but it doesn't even work f5. You, yeah, f5 okay. can be very powerful. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, it doesn't even work. And also, I'm just retreating bishops. No, I just saw the idea of b4 and trying to get the rook to be what? No, there's nothing. No, okay, it's too early in the morning for me. I'm not coming up with good lines. Okay, so queen e2, queen e2, c5. Okay, c5. So instead of c5, instead of c5, black can also go bishop e7 first. But I think it's very important if black wants to win. For example, with white, it would be, I think, a great thing to play c5 if she can, at mm -hmm. one point. So for black, this would be the only possible way of really playing for a win. If she can make sure that white is not playing c5 and she plays c5, queen c6, and really at some point, rook d8, f6, knight f8. So in, in, uh, uh, in the other hand for white, it means that white has to be very precise and keep an eye for attack, queen h5, queen g4, putting pressure on the f7, not allowing f5 or f6. But it yeah. means that it's going to be very sharp now. So things can be tricky. And now look at that, Juve and Jun is behind time again. Yeah, but in light of all this, I, I'm thinking that queen e2, is an inaccuracy because if the queen was standing on d2 you could at least back this up with b4 you know you see i had this idea queen d2 somehow and queen bishop h6 also there mm -hmm. yeah well subtleties in the end so queen yes. d2 instead of moving the queen to e2 is perhaps the most accurate try bishop yeah, because once I like your plan. Once c5 comes, and well, we rook have a move. D8. Rook d8 played, very natural. And you I know why she whether... played it? I guess she wants to be bringing her knight already to f8. Mm -hmm. At yeah. the same time, I don't like it. Yeah, maybe I just go rook c. Uh, well, yeah. Rook ah, c5, but c5 but c5 now. C5 happens. Hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of really. Yes, I guess also I really wanted to go bishop e3, but c5 is still happening. Oh, but hang on a second, c5 is a mistake. Bishop c5. Or what? Why b? What is it? Why? Why is this a mistake? I. Uh, Maybe I Queen don't know. G. Queen H5. Queen H5. Double attack. <gasps> oi, 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 oi. No, I'm telling oh. you, Rook D8, I don't like. Oh. No, no, no. But this is. This is deep stuff, though. I. No, but this uh, is. Nice uh, move there. Yeah, because Rook D8 gives two, two very bad things for black. First of all, the F7 pawn is vulnerable. And secondly, even with c5, knight b7 kind of things. Hang on a second. Is a uh, queen... No, queen f2 h5 is, is not hanging. possible. F2 because f2 hanging. is hanging. So, okay. I and like your bishop e3 and after queen c7, b4. Bishop e3 on the board. On the board. Yeah. And now... White is going to cement this knight onto d6 by playing b4, c5. 
or just B4, as long as you control C5, then this knight is not yes, going to get chased away. Yes, because, you know, C5, I like in principle, but at the same time that now, after rook d8, black can be fast, play knight mm -hmm. uh, f8, knight g6, and one day, if she has an opportunity to play knight e5, knight d5, yeah. that would be not promising for white. That's true. Knight e yes, knight e7 and knight d5. You have to remember, you know, if squares are like the currency. Just be careful about yeah. conceding them. And uh, knight e7, knight d5, yes. So best is to go queen c after queen c7. And there's a lot of uh, complexity, as we saw the chat saying. Because say you make a move like queen a5, well, f7 is loose. So as Judith pointed out, Queen H5 is a huge threat on the board. So only really one. But you know what is my question? Mm -hmm. What happens if after Queen C7, White anyway goes Queen H5? You're in trouble with your bishop. Yes, yes, you you can could say that. <laughs> um, but what what can okay, Black okay, do? Okay, okay. I don't understand. I I can do this. I can be all flashy and play this. I and know. The evaluation I know. bar says no, you cannot get away with such nonsense. So the idea was if you go pawn takes bishop, yeah, but I'm not gonna going to go here to first. And okay. then you see the evaluation bar go down. Okay. Great. But I'm not going to take <laughs> your very nicely offered bishop on f6. I'm going to go after bishop f6. I don't know. Even c5, I can do a rook d1, and I'm going to be smiling. That's true. And yeah. And you're not. Or I'm Black not smiling. Not. <laughs> no, I am not. I'm not smiling but, here. But now okay, I don't Queen understand, H5, really. Queen H5. How to save this. Okay, so Bishop then G5, maybe F4. Bishop G5 first. Okay, so Bishop, yes. F4. And then you go F4. And now I guess I have to go. You have G6, here. but... Oh, yeah, yeah, I have g6. Yes, yes, yes. But, okay, so what? G6, queen, h3. But now... Now I'm going to get checkmated, aren't I? No, bishop... Now I go bishop, b7. And I say, do you want to trade? You can take my h6 pawn, but I'm going to get rid of your knight. And queen, c7, indeed, played by... Yeah. Very dangerous position for black. Mm -hmm. It's you see, I mean, black is playing the only moves. Only moves mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, she is having to walk that tightrope. And uh, we it was a big mistake. Yeah. I feel like these natural moves can't be called big mistakes, but it does. I am leaning towards the fact that it's a mistake. I'm going but to concede sorry. that it's a mistake. <laughs> but I'm sorry, I don't even understand rook d8. Uh -huh. I mean, basically, yeah. it does not make too much sense to put your rook on the d5 because it's blocking the d6. The only thing I understand that she wants to regroup her knight from h7. But yeah. that's, uh, that was not a priority. No. No, 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 no. Now we're seeing it very clear that uh, the f7 point was in fact targeted and now this bishop on h4 is awkwardly placed and as you've highlighted queen h5 big move there on the board and i mean what else is there there's also b4 happening oops not there b4 uh, but that, I, I like your idea of just going queen h5 well, this is the straightforward which we have to check at first. That's for sure. Bishop g5, f4, you go bish, uh, you go g6. Yeah, queen goes back to h3. Bishop, bishop goes to e7. e7. C5. C5, H5, yeah. yeah. Yep g4 you're speaking my language pawn takes uh, no i guess i have to go pawn takes pawn queen takes pawn yeah the more i'm looking at it, the more i'm panicking uh 
how to untangle. I don't know. King G2, Rook H1. Maybe, maybe Bishop F8. King G2? Yeah. And you go Bishop G7, Rook H1, Knight F8, right? Yeah, that's... <laughs> it's and not something I'm proud pray. of. And you pray. <laughs> yes. But praying is That's not very a important. Plan. That part is the most important at this stage. <laughs> um. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't have big hopes for Black's position. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. No, what this about is Bishop not. Bishop F two, Bishop F two, and Bishop H four. Yeah, Bishop H two. You're breaking it down. No. Okay. Well, I, I well. Well, well, well. Maybe the queen can come out. One active yeah, piece. Yeah, but not yet. I think because no, knight b seven. No, knight, knight b seven is. But coming. generally speaking, that's the that's the move I have to look after all the time. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So still, this is not a picture. Bishop f two. Mm. Okay, so let's. Let, I mean, I could have. Could I? Could black do better than bishop h7, bishop e7 e is forced, c5. h5 feels forced. I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe this is the best move, bishop, bishop f8. f8. And don't, don't allow white any open lines. King f2. Are you still coming? I have a feeling you're still going to crack open the position somehow. Do I? Uh, yeah. Okay, Maybe so it's going to be six. Yeah, I wanted to destabilize this knight. And if I couldn't destabilize it, then I wanted to open up a, a line. And of course, if if during this game at this point, let's say if Juventus starts to have those thoughts that oh my god, I cannot lose this game, I cannot lose this game because then the game the match is over, those things when it sneaks into your brain that you have to avoid. Mm. So this is one oh. of the the most difficult thing in such a position is to keep thinking only about the position, what is really going on on the board. And uh, well, this one certainly looks double edged. And I have to say, at points, it does look quite promising for white. And uh, we do see Lady J. She's settling down for a big think. And Queen H5 is the most straightforward way to attack. It's not the only way, though. You can, of course, go B4 and just say, I will cement this knight on d6 and I will just grab as much space as possible on the queen side and just say to white, sorry, say to black rather, you can't play a thing. You can't make a move. Because I yeah, can it's... see situations like, you know, you go b4. Okay, the computer doesn't like it, but I was just thinking if you go a4, a5, a4, A5, and then suddenly you're threatening this pawn on A7. It's not easy to defend. Or you, or you just crack open a line. So for instance, if the bishop comes down, I know that this is go C5 and then back that up with B5 and try to get a rook onto the seventh. I Still mean, this feels, is also quite nice for white. Mm, feels quite scary for black. Ooh. But predict, you know, knowing Leighton J style, I think that we are going to see the move Queen H5 on the board. It's straightforward. It provokes an extra weakness on the king side that Black has to look after. Mm. And very important moment here. Queen H5, Queen, and uh, taking a look at the clock times, we can see Leighton J is uh, under 30 he's just under 39 minutes so slightly less time than ju and june so very evenly matched well it's Ooh. again a very critical moment in the game i must say mm -hmm. that knight e4 was a very important moment which she played few moves ago i mean look the 
what a difference the knight makes on g3 or whether it's on d6. Mm -hmm. Because on d6 <laughs> it's just uh, basically paralyzing whole black's position to be active. Yeah, it is certainly a thorn in black's side. And it is a nice big moment there for Leighton J. We are seeing her deep in thoughts and it's the perfect moment for us to take a break from this very complicated sharp position because the action is brewing in the wonderful city of Chongqing where the show has moved to. And there we see it is the city of lights. It is the city that never sleeps and just join us in a, in a few moments after this very short break. Do you wish playing a chess game with a friend was as easy as sending them a text? Well, good news. Now it is. With Chess.com's new iMessage app, you can start and play a game directly in iMessage. Your friend doesn't even need a Chess.com account. It's just tap and play. Head over to go.chess.com slash iMessage or use the command iMessage in chat to learn more. Chess Kid is fun. Chess is great for the brain, but it's also fun to play. And Chess Kid makes it easy to have fun. Whether your child is a total beginner or a prodigy, they can hop on and find a well-matched opponent from around the world at any time. Chess Kid is the safe, parent-approved way for your child to play chess online. Chess Kid is educational. To kids, it feels just like playing, but chess is a great way to learn patience, strategy, and critical thinking. Chess Kid features a comprehensive training program that guides kids to level up on their way to mastery. There are more than 50,000 chess puzzles and a whole library of entertaining videos that teach strategies, tactics, openings, and end games specifically for kids. Chess Kid is easy. Whether you're a parent helping your child, a coach managing dozens of kids, or a school of hundreds. Signing up is free and easy, so what are you waiting for? Chess.com's game review recently got a major update. Here are four key notes. At the end of each game review, you will now see a summary of the game from your coach, your performance rating for that game, and a quick grade for you and your opponent in the opening, middle game, and end game. We've added a new classification called Miss for when a move fails to take advantage of an opportunity, but it is otherwise a sound move. We've also changed the definition of blunder. Now a move will only be considered a blunder if it loses material or allows a checkmate. Coach will now draw arrows and highlight squares when you hover over or click on the highlighted words in the move explanations. This should make move explanations easier to follow. Finally, coach's explanations will now reference specific pieces and threats in explanations, making move explanations much more intuitive. The new game review experience is available on chess.com right now.
China, the world's oldest civilization was born here. Thousands of years later, it is one of the world's chess powerhouses. For most of the past 30 years, China has held the most prestigious title in women's chess. The legacy of the Women's World Championship is rich. Menchik, Gaprindashvili and Chibodanitsa, Kostenyuk, Zijun and Ho Yifan. Now three-time world champion Ju Wenjun is defending her title once more. After vanquishing the likes of Katerina Lagno and Alexandra Goryashkina, another rival awaits. Challenger Lei Tingzhe had to defeat three grandmasters in matches herself to get here. In the first two rounds of the candidates, she took on sisters Maria and Anna Muzichuk and won. Then in the final, she beat former world champion Tang Zhongyi. And that's it! Designation! Lei Tingzhi, the winner of the 2023 Honey Dates Finals. Will Ju Wenjun defend? Or will we have a first-time champion, Lei Tingzhe? Half the match is in Ju's hometown of Shanghai. Half the match in Chongqing, where Lei hails from. Who will win and claim their share of the 500,000 euro prize fund? Welcome to the official broadcast of the 2023 FIDE Women's Chess Championship. Hello everyone and we are back and as predicted there is now fire on the board in game 7 of the Women's World Championship match between Lei Ting Jae with the white pieces and Ju Wen Jun. And Judith, I am proud to be able to say that we correctly guessed the player's next moves. So Queen H5, let's let's uh, we left you well, with a cliffhanger, would Lei Ting J just to solidify her position, her queenside advantage, or would she go for the immediate, well, queen h5? And queen h5, of course, it did happen. And of course, this did set off a chain of motion that uh, bishop g5, f4, and g6 on the board. But now, not queen h3, but queen f3. Interesting decision there. I, I, I guess that uh, Lei Ting Jae is saying, well, Queen H3 isn't going to give me any dividends. So the Queen stands well on F3. So Bishop E7 looks, oops, don't know how that happened. Bishop E7 does look like it's forced. And then question. Well, for me, it's a question why to go to F3 and not to H3. What, what does it benefit for white? Mm -hmm. It seems that uh, she just wants to go c5 and strengthen her position, her knight on d6. And she thinks that anyway I'm going to be playing g3, king g2, rook h1, or g4, king g2, rook h1. And only in a later stage I want to put my queen on h3. Well, we need to guess no more because after bishop e7, c5 was the immediate response from Lei Ting J. And... You're, you guessed it once again. The idea was just simply to cement that knight onto d6. And now she does have a choice, as you've highlighted. She can try to crack open a line on the queen side, or she can uh, play in the center. Or maybe even play <laughs> against the king. Yeah, it's a big question for black, actually, whether can she ever take on d6? Mm -hmm. and, because uh, this it looks ugly this way and it looks ugly that way this is what I can tell you <laughs> <laughs> either way something I would not like to be on on the black side yeah yeah this, the question is this knight isn't it it's like this knight on age 7 it's never it's, it's kind of caged in and it doesn't have a good future well, it has one dream, dream place. But yes. Probably it, it will never get there. Well, this is why I was perhaps inspired by your idea of um, 
playing f5. I wondered whether I could do that. You know, if you go pawn takes pawn, I'm just going to go knight takes and introduce my you knight mean to d5. Yeah, yeah, if I can get away, I know, I know, I know, this breaks all the rules because you're you're really not meant to push pawns on the side that you're weakest, yada, 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 you're not meant to weaken your king. But I'm really uncomfortable with this knight on d6 and I don't like this prospect of going bishop takes knight. So if I can, and I see the evaluation board hates it but doesn't hate it as much, and yeah, it completely is true. This is not a comfortable position for black. Black's extra pawn is meaningless. Well, the first thing has to be checked. This e takes f6 and passant. Yeah, and my idea was to get that one into the game. Oh, oh, for a minute it liked my uh, knight f6. I just wanted to get the knight into the game. And also one thing, I might also take that back actually because it might be more important to put the bishop on the long diagonal yes but in that case okay queen h3 i can you not win a pawn immediately with this knight f8 i thought nah don't worry i have the same idea to win a pawn immediately it's only <laughs> that it's queen h3 it's, uh, i hope that you cannot defend both of your pawns yeah, 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 yeah. Queen h3, queen h3. And yes, I cannot defend. That is true. I give you that. But at the same time, this one you is. You can go hanging. knight f8. Yeah, knight f8, yes. queen h6, bishop b2, and then you drive back your bishop to g7 with the tempo. Yeah. And somehow or other, I feel that black will be happier here than the position that we see on the board because with that knight cemented on d6 and white with his ironclad grip in the center it feels very very uncomfortable for black to play well this is a big moment for black to to check whether f5 is uh, possible and she wants to go or she just sits and waits until there are mm -hmm. better times but i don't see how it will be better times for her Okay, so f5. Let's uh, try to refute that one. So f5. Because if white is not exchanging on f6, this is the other question, then black can play uh, h5, stopping forever white playing g4, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, Unless you're doing g4 now. Yeah. Yeah, g4 now can be uh, something serious. At the same time, uh, I don't know if after bishop d6, what do I take with the c or the, with the e pawn? Probably with the e pawn should be better. Yeah, um, my feeling is the, the e pawn, but now the, with f5 on the board, the queen can swing over to g7. g7. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to French dream of knight style. f6, knight d5. One I keep day. dreaming. I keep dreaming because that's uh, really dream, dream stuff for black. Yeah. And uh, yeah, on that subject, are you a pessimist, optimist over the chessboard or just a realist? Well, when I was a kid, uh, I was a real optimist, of course, with my G4 stuff and uh, aggressive play. Later on, uh, it depended on the position, uh, on the structure. When I had healthy attacking positions, I could uh, be sometimes even over optimistic. And then when I got some lessons, I realized that maybe it's better not to. But also <laughs> there are some tricky positions where it seems for your eye really appealing. And then you have to figure out that, well, actually it's only the looks. When you start... Yeah. Uh, Analyzing it, it's by far not so good as it looks at first. Yeah. You, but you generally, I was, I was more optimistic and realistic than pessimistic. Yes, okay, optimistic. I'm, I'm quite optimistic. And I, I always try to be optimistic when I'm defending as well. But you just remind me of that rhyme that they have. Uh, if you ever go to the cities of Oxford and Cambridge, they always have this postcard which says, the more I know, the the, le the more I find out, the less I know. 
the, the more I know, the more the more I forget. <laughs> the more I forget, the less I know. So <laughs> why bother? Yeah, but I also learned uh, when I was preparing. It, it, during preparation, you can be very pessimistic, you know, because mm. uh, you play against a strong player. You make your preparation. You can you don't find any advantage here with white. You don't find any advantage there. You have problems here. You have problems there. And then I understood that no matter how many problems I have to deal with at the board, I only have to deal with one. <laughs> and yeah. this cheered me up that it's only one I have to deal with of the many problems or many questions I have. <laughs> it's a good philosophy in life, you know, and yeah. talking about how, how ever only one problem that uh, Ji Wenjin has to deal with. Well, she has to deal with a knight on d6. And once she's got that one in the back, then she can move on to doing other things in her position. But for the time being, it's a pretty big problem. And uh, they have just played 26 moves and just 31 minutes left on the clock. And of course, the players are getting that 30 second move, 30 second time increment per move. Well, now I think Juven Jun is having a difficult moment because she has to make a very serious decision to play f5 or not to play f5. And it seems like in every move we have these uh, serious questions because if black plays f5, then white has in a different uh, difficult dilemma whether to capture it on f6, to play g4, or just to play slowly. And we see b6 first. Mm-hmm. B6 I thought was entirely it was a good move as well because if you if white did want to play B4 then you do have the opening of the B line to contend with so nice decision well, but the but the consequences though is that this pawn is weak on C6 yes but the question is how are you going to be reacting with white because if you go B4 then black can capture on c5 and if your idea with b4 is to capture it with the pawn then black can go rook b8 and suddenly finally black has some mm. activity for his rook which obviously he does not have when he's uh, looking uh, the d6 knight so yeah. then probably it's a kind of relief for black to go rook b8 and also at one time she she might be playing knight f8 knight d7 so now I think Black would, could say that she improved a little bit on her position. Yeah. At least she gets a little hope of activity. That, uh, that is absolutely true. But uh, unfortunately for Black, the <laughs> White isn't obliged to take on c5 with the pawn, but can actually capture with the bishop. Mm -hmm. And there are targets there on the board. So for instance, if you went b4, I'm just saying there's also the possibility of rook c1, which you do need to calculate as well. Pawn takes, bishop takes would be the response. Although immediately... And bar, don't forget, my dream can come true. Knight f6. Ah. It's worth dreaming, you know. It's good to dream because eventually sometimes uh, uh, you get it. You even announced it to me. That it was going to be happening at one point and uh, still I let you get what you wanted. So yeah. You see, I'm okay. optimistic. It is. Then it's a big threat. So after b6, hang on a second. If you were to go rook c1, which was my other idea, pawn takes. I mean, do you have moves like rook takes c5? I thought of that at first, but I'm not sure that uh, you will be so happy after rook c5. I would be taking on d6. And your idea was rook c6, right? That was yes. your plan. Yeah. Queen uh, b8. And I guess let's keep the rooks on the board. Queen b2. Yeah, I had a feeling you would do that too. To the I right like position. pawns too, not only you. <laughs> but you didn't take d6, you took you took the no, one I really want. I, I didn't select, want you. I make a selection <laughs> which one I take, but I like them. Yeah, to sacrifice and, and to take as well. Both ways. Yeah. Okay. So b6 
it's a great move from uh, Leighton J and uh, we can see the jacket is off so she is coming into serious thoughts so, so maybe B4 is just force maybe it's just one of those things you have to accept Yes, but don't forget that we were analyzing Queen H3, where Black had no time to play B6 kind of move. There, there were a lot of action. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. This, and this way that uh, that late thing G, she played King Queen F3. Now Black has a time to breathe, and yeah. that's why she was able to play B6. Yeah, because we we were looking at those moves after say Queen H. In this no no not in this type of position let me just go a bit back and after g6 to go not to f3 but to h3 with the queen. yeah yeah so after hang on i will find the position ah, ha, ha. okay so, so let me just go back a few mo a few more moves after f4 yeah, G6. Uh, after f4 so we were looking at queen h3 upon which she has to go back and then you reinforce and then you get this so already it does feel just by having that time to attack the pawn you do get you got in c5 for free and you're able to bolster it as well for free well of course the question is whether on h3 the queen what is it doing and if you can take advantage of this extra pawn because when the queen on f3 puts pressure on c6 so after rook c1 black would not be able to play c b6 so I think b6 was kind of a must in the position, mm -hmm. in the game position. Yeah. Because if black would not play b6, then white would be playing rook c1 and really make some good prophylactical uh, moves. Yeah. So this was a uh, rook c1 and preventing the breakout over here. So very accurately played by Ju Wenjun to b6. What other responses are there? Yes, and it's interesting that these kind of positions we are looking just generally, observing what is positionally, and then when we start looking at it by concrete means, then it becomes reality that sometimes, oh, one tampi is missing, or black can play b6. So it's a, an opportunity for a breakout for her. Yeah. And uh, there we do see that the uh, trade of pawns and uh, black seizing the open line. And what we I just saw a question there from our chat saying that uh, the more the game goes on or the more the match continues, the more pressure there is on uh, Ju Wenjun. And what is the psychological effect of this? Does she panic? <laughs> I mean, how do you dig deep and avoid that kind of negative sensations? Well, I think for someone who played uh, on top of the world for quite some time and being a cha world champion for five years, she is not the type of person who is going to be panicking, really. Mm -hmm. She might lose the match, but uh, most likely it's not going to be because of a panicking uh, thing. It's, uh, but of course, the, the pressure and the stress is there. And of course, it reaches everybody, no matter how strong you are. But uh, as far as I see, she's handling the game very logically and she's fighting. Yeah. And, and what do you think it means to be a woman's world champion or your world champion? You know, you get to have this crown on your head, but does it make life enjoyable i mean you have direct experience with your sister being women's world champion and whoa hang on a second you might have to wait to answer that one because g4 g4, g4. has been played and mm. my instinct is uh, i'm not sure about that one and i am someone who loves to push pawns i'm also not sure about that at all that the g4 will be very beneficial and and if, if white is really in that situation that uh, this should be the move it, it can be tricky it mm -hmm. can be tricky because rook on b2 will show up and if the queen also can show up at some point uh, through a5 break into the uh, it's very tricky because f5 is not the end of the world for black at all the knight, G, knight from h7 can break out from there to g5 yeah Shall we, shall we deep dive? Because 
I'm very excited by this position because, well, it looks like black might be also counterattacking. So say, for instance, you go rook b2. Why not? Yep. Put that rook on an active line. Cut off the king. And The only uh, thing is, yeah, the question is whether you can you really attack there or bishop d4 and I'm pushing you back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> How frustrating after the <laughs> excitement that I finally had one piece out. And then now I'm like, oh, because if I go rook c2, it's simply going to attack me and I just don't have any squares. So no, that I can kill that idea and we can't go for that one. So yeah, no, you, that was a cold shower indeed. But what so. do you think about queen a5? Yeah, okay, so that goes to the next uh, queen a5. I don't like and... g4, though I'm a big signature person of g4. Yeah, this is your move, right? Yeah. And queen, queen, so first of all, queen takes pawn. You don't touch that one at all. That one will not make you well because the queen comes to c3 and attacks the bishop and the rook. You need to maintain some defensive connection. So queen a5, excellent move. Um, how do you stop the queen from coming into c3? Well, first of all, I can say that in the last three moves, black made a huge change in the position. This we cannot uh, deny. And I think g4 was a very risky decision by white because I'm not sure she realized that suddenly two of black's pieces is going to get activity. And it's huge because the rook on a1 is not active, right? So the rook from a1 had to be placed in a better place into the game first. And also it would have been important, I believe, that instead of g4, that white is making more attention, focus on limit the opportunities for black species, the queen and the rook. And now after yeah. queen a5, look, Ju Wenjun stood up for the first time from her chair. <laughs> that, it's like that is she well broke out of the cage <laughs> <laughs> take that one yeah no um, i mean also this would be a big victory for ju Wen jun to win with the black pieces tomorrow she will have white and okay this is also setting the scene for the second half of the match and it does feel like because the two the two halves have been played in uh, two different country, uh, two con countries, two, two different cities. It's like they had separate tournaments. They had one tournament, Leighton J won that one. Now we have something completely fresh. And uh, Queen A5, the idea I think of this Queen can to be, C3. This Rick can be a B2 turning point coming. of the game. It's definitely a huge moment. And uh, look at the White King. It's in big trouble here. I, I completely agree with you. This is a big moment and I feel that white has to play very accurately in order to neutralize this. So for instance, you can't stop rook b2 happening. You can't stop, well, queen c3 you can stop. The problem and is I've... that g4 doesn't make any sense, you know, because mm. you cannot go g5 because you're slow. After uh, G5, not only G5, sorry, F5. Because after F5, this incredible, typical, powerful move Queen C3. Exactly. And it's like the Rook falls, the E5 pawn falls. And yeah, you just don't have time. I mean, say for instance, you go, yeah, in for the penny, in for the pound. I think Bishop G5, killing all your ideas of tactics. Yeah. So I think uh, maybe bishop g5 is not even the best. Knight g5 is also possible. But what I want to uh, highlight and say that in this position after queen a5, it's the, one of the most difficult things to realize that, oops, I simply allowed something which I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, which is the most painful in a position where just two, three moves before you said, okay, I'm white, I have full compensation, it's only me who is playing for a win. And suddenly the alert is, is uh, ringing the, that, uh-oh, maybe this is the moment I should look for a draw. I should be happy for just make a draw in this game. 
actually the players to their credit have been very good at backpedaling and saying okay now i've gone too far i need to start looking out for ways to let's draw. see but here but here Maybe. you know you feel like it's not that easy because you've weakened the well what is weakened the king and this rook is coming this queen is coming to c3 i feel like the queen coming to c3 is very very dangerous and I don't know, like I, I saw someone suggesting bishop d4 as a good move for white. I was thinking about I'm bishop so f2. Sure. I was thinking bishop f2 as well. The reason I wasn't keen, I wasn't wasn't sure about this one is because it does leave queen to d2 as a possibility. Maybe it's okay for white, but I also had the instinct to protect the king and bishop to d2. So queen a5, bishop to f2. I think it's very important somehow not to allow black to go to c3 with her queen. Mm -hmm. But of course, after bishop f2, queen d2 might be unpleasant. Yeah. No, still, there's uh, no aggressive intentions. Um, you see, there are a lot like of that. movements by lay. Uh, look, hand moving. Yeah. It's getting uncomfortable. <laughs> She's <laughs> squirming. <laughs> <laughs> Wriggling in the hot seat. <laughs> Rick to D1. Um, okay, the, the evaluation, but uh, just like, no. What are you doing? Well, probably Black is just capturing the pawn on A2. The, pro uh, the real problem I see right now, that the pieces and the pawns look very beautiful for mm. white. The only problem is that they cannot go and improve that setup. You see this G four pawn? It's a it's a it's a baddie. It's not a good move. It's a too weakening. And uh, like you say, when it came to that critical moment, Leiting J should have restrained her instincts and simply said, "Okay, let me find something else." Because why should uh, g4 work because black ultimately hadn't done anything wrong and we see instead that rook f1 queen a5 on the board rook f1 played she's almost 10 minutes behind i mean okay eight eight and a half behind mm -hmm. uh, on clock and the moment for ji wenjin to consider does she need to worry about f5? Does she need to worry about queen takes pawn? f5, we had neutralized, right? Well, F5, we talked five, about just... queen c3 talk... here. Right. So the queen c3 being, so say queen c3, you play that move. Just but my question, but coming. sorry, my question is also what happens if queen a2? Because that, yeah. that should be the first move we consider. Is it queen c6 white wants to play or f5? Yeah, I mean, give me the pawn. <laughs> you know me well, Judith. I'm taking yeah. that one. <laughs> sorry that I even considered something else. <laughs> <laughs> f5 kind of felt like you could neutralize that one. But I, but I, queen takes c six. But I, okay, I should I should wind my neck back in and also just also show because f five yeah. will be scary to lots of people. But I think queen c six is good because after queen e two you can come back to f three, and uh, unless the d six knight will be eliminated, the c six is very powerful and there is no good way for black. So mm -hmm. I like your queen c six. And that's why probably but I would not go queen a two, but play queen c three to stop this queen c6 option yeah and uh, just to kind of what is the way to neutralize this attack for black well i would start thinking of e takes f5 and let's say gf and now maybe bishop g5 yeah because uh, yeah, with my a2 two. queen yeah i defend very well not only attack on the second rank mm. yeah and this one looks very shaky for white. This is the perfect Karakhan counterattack. And okay, so qu queen c3, okay. 
We do have. Yeah, we, this we is the most leave. important right now for black to to be active and uh, make prophylactic moves. So white cannot take on c6, cannot play f5. Then things are really good for black because the d6 knight right now, if you look at it, is just standing there beautifully, but it's not uh, blocking much of the the black species because they just simply went on the b5. They went around. around yeah. Yeah, so the d6 is very beautiful, but actually it's not doing much because things are going to be happening on the second rank and the third rank where uh, uh, Ju Wen Jun created for herself this opportunity to break out with b6, opening the file, and then rook b8, queen a5, queen c3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and most certainly. And... The question for white, though, is how are you going to continue? Because obviously you can't go queen takes c6, rook b2 is coming. I think f5, there is still a nice line to show that queen e5 is not possible because of knight f7. Yeah, that's a very nice point. And if king takes, pawn F2 takes, g6. And, and, and uh, queen f7, king checkmate. Checkmate and... Whoops, that would certainly end the game, as checkmate always does. And now the queen. The queen e5, not possible. Queen e5 is not possible, but what is possible is bishop g5 or knight g5. These are the two very aggressive reaction to f5. Mm -hmm. Though... You can go bishop g5, bishop takes g5, queen f3, rook f3, knight g5, and then you swing to a3. Yeah. And after rook b4. f takes Still. g6. Takes takes on g4, king goes out, or fg immediately, doesn't matter, rook a7. I mean, it's, I mean, white is in danger. After rook a7, also knight f3, knight e5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there is, a, I can on this, instead of this, knight f3, and then knight comes to take e5. So that's like one way that black can neutralize and get a slightly better end game or better endgame. I feel like white is quite active there. Um, other possibilities after f5. You can also capture on f5 first and then jump in with a piece. You mean e takes f5? Yeah, e takes, yeah. And immediately the evaluation bar goes up. So this is not the way to do it. Yeah, I don't know exactly why. But yeah, because the g4 pawn was something that we were taking with the rook. Yeah. So, okay. and in, on e6, it gives a stability for black's position. Keep the pawn there. But the other idea was uh, knight g5, which we can consider and check after f5, which also makes uh, sense. Yep. Let me just go one move back. Though after knight g5, maybe white can go also queen g3 to try. And no, no, no. we have a move from late in j. She's no f5. And instead she attacks the queen with knight e4. Moving back. I don't think that move even occurred to me. Moving the knight back from its prized square of uh, d6. But the problem is, what else did you have in mind? I mean, we were checking f5, which probably not the best. Yeah. And then what can you do? You wait and sit and wait and wait until uh, black goes rook b2 and queen d3 or becoming more active. This is when uh, things look good, but actually it's not that good. And it's huge danger for white... Uh, that that black mm -hmm. will control the second and third rank with his her pieces yeah that's true that is very true it's very important to be able to pivot in your thinking and i was completely fixated on keeping that knight on d6 but okay once the queen moves first of all 
does the black have to be precise for instance and play queen b2 just to keep the connection with the e5 pawn what about queen or, d3 yeah queen d3 so at least you keep a connection with the bishop and now it's not only that but what i'm thinking about to play rook b1 at uh, some point but you can't go f5 so that was the for me i think you can just take take and i'm gonna guess you can do this oh it's this bad already well, the knight's no longer yeah. on d6, because before understand. you could go knight, your knight takes b5 and go, yeah, well, you're in problems, and now... You know what? What so is F5. your bet for the outcome of the game? Let's make uh, predictions. I think black will win. You, this feels you took like my prediction. I can't say that. Then. But I no, also... you can. You can. You I can. can. Uh, this really no, but this really does feel like a typical Cairo position where, you know, white has had the space, but black has broken out, and with those two active pieces, they can harass the white king, and I feel like it's very difficult for Lady J, and also, it, it won't suit her strengths as well to defend a position with her king so exposed. We've seen her play in games. We've seen her survive heavy pressure from Ju Wenjun, but it was a different type of nature. Her king was never in any danger, and here it just feels like things can go wrong. Yeah, I also I mean, have uh, wrong. not a good feeling for White, but uh, but maybe she can save it. But it will be very difficult game for her this part. Hmm. But I understand your well, feeling completely. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether it's kind of heavily influenced by the fact that Ju and Jun play the Karakan, and so I have some kind of emotional attachment there. But uh, yeah, Queen E3 on the board, Queen, sorry, Queen, Queen D3. D3 on the board. But to tell you the truth, like five moves ago, I would bet uh, on, uh, on, I would put more on uh, Lei Qingli. Mm. I would say before yeah. b6, like uh, if she would go queen h3, let's say there in the very after g6, I so, would put my money so, more on white's position. Yeah. I mean, this position looked fantastic for white. I mean, it looked like action was brewing. Uh, it was just a question whether white could break through. And when you compare this to move 24, where white is in full control, it's about to cement a knight on d6. Yeah. to this position it's, it really is like hello what happened here what went wrong and well if Leighton J manages to turn this one around if she manages to hold on I will be very impressed by her resourcefulness and she has just over 17 minutes on the clock she's challenged now mm. and it's a huge huge game right now for the match hmm it is it is because the the players they've moved location they're staying in different hotels they've broken their rhythms this feels like a new tournament for both of them and late j starting with the white pieces it's a nightmare to lose such a game so queen d3 she has some choices. What she cannot do is <laughs> blindly continue with her attack with f5 because there is no attack. The only person attacking there is black. Um, other possibilities for Leighton J. Maybe she can chase away the rook. To be honest, I don't know because I think white has a huge difficulty right now. Because after rook d1, the problem is rook d1, black is playing rook b1 and immediately exchanging yeah. the rooks. And that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that after exchanging the rooks, the A2 pawn is falling off. When it rains, it pours. Yeah. So rook D1. <laughs> so rook D1 <laughs> is kind of losing already, right? F5, right? F5 cannot be played. But then what can you yeah, play? Yeah, exactly. I mean, what are you going to play? Is bishop C1 the best move, trying to exchange the queens with the better circumstances or what? Or you go king g2 and after rook b2 I, to play rook f2. I go king, king g2 and try to 
just uh, scurry away with the king, but mm, yeah, Rook. But if you go Rook F two, well, maybe you have some chances at holding this. But after Rook F two, I can go. What about Rook B four? Okay, you have to mm -hmm. go Knight D six back, right? And yep. then uh, maybe Bishop H four. But also, instead of rook b4, rook b1 uh, could make sense. Yeah, so go back to rook I mean, one thing is sure, rook. white should be fighting for a draw by now. That's that's very clear. So and it rook, is something you I mean, don't want to no admit. Attack. But it also, also, what happens if you're very clinical about it? Black is a pawn up, after all, and just, just okay. grab that. Bishop, what about bishop f2? Bishop f2. Uh, you know, you have the better queen. Let's let's come in to here or something. Queen d5 also you had an option. Yeah, well, but I, I thought the a2 pawn. And I, You're hunting I again. It. Okay. <laughs> yes. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Yes. Yeah, queen c2 is good. Yeah. Okay, maybe you can hold me. Get like, I mean, where's there is no breakthrough, and the knight does come to d6, so there is. Well, knight f8, maybe. And then knight d6. Um, bishop h4. Oh. Oi, 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 oi. That's so easy as well. Mm. No, this is, uh, and then the c5 pawn is just going to fall off. Knight d7 is coming. Why is in a complete bind? So I, it just, and remember, Ju Wen Jun's skill, I mean, her strengths are the positional. And she's made it clear, you know, she will go into an endgame if given the chance. And she will just massage out every single advantage. Yeah, unfortunately, queen d3, king g2 is going to fail to rook b2 because if if the best move after rook f2 is to capture it, there's absolutely no way that Ju Wenjun won't go into the end game. Yeah. Yes, but I just simply don't see uh, so such a good alternatives for white because look, the d3 square also so powerful for the black queen. Mm. That is true. That is true. Yes. What about moves like? Can you bail out with a draw like this? Like it, it, queen d five. <laughs> don't judge me. Queen d five. Queen d five, and then come back <laughs> and then draw. And a two, a two. You forgot about oh, grabbing that. Yeah, I, I forgot. Oh god. Yeah, and I've, I've literally done nothing with the position. So. Mm -mm. Okay, that is not after queen d3. This is the position on the board. Lating J, just over 12 minutes on the clock, and she has played king g2. 12 minutes on the clock. Look at that. Mm -hmm. So things are really going uh, badly. You can see on the body language, on the clock, and on the board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, also reading Ju Wan Jun's body language. Yeah, Look at that. like this is I a have new a, person. I have an opportunity. I'm gonna win. I can hunt down now. Mm hmm. There we see it. And rook b two is the move that we are expecting. But Jiwon is certainly enjoying her position. Rook b one also, also very tempting, I must say. Rook b one. Yeah. Why not? And you know, if Ji Wen Jun wins, I'm really looking forward to the press conference with Lei Ting Jie because Lei Ting Jie has been really quite charismatic. She does, they don't say that much during the press conferences, but uh, Lei Ting Jie with her expression, she's always like, mm, mm. <laughs> and then it, she's very revealing there. And she she leaves everybody to guess which one is which fifty percent. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I would like to see a press conference where. <laughs> Elay is not happy with the outcome. And uh, rook b1 could be a move. Rook b2. Yeah, rook b2. Okay, so yeah, rook b1. Let's have a look at that. Trade off rooks. 
and yes well. because now of course the question is it's basically black can exchange the rooks in different ways but just the difference is the circumstances what she prefers mm -hmm. and if uh, Leighton J says no I will live by the sword and I will die by the sword Rook F2 well, what is it the... will happen <laughs> <laughs> Actually, isn't Ricky one quite good? Isn't that I don't know, but something on the first rank. Kill. And you see, yeah, like immediately after G4, it's basically for white, all three ranks are very weak. The first, the second, and the third in different ways. Yeah. Lots of weaknesses for white. And also sometimes Bishop H4, just for the fun of it. <laughs> can, can ruin and your day <laughs> you certainly can ruin Leighton J's day not my day for my day is uh, just going to be much uh, was a lot of fun basically analysing with you Judith and well this is a huge point in game 7 because it does look like Ju Wenjun is primed to make a big comeback on the very first day that these two players are playing in a new town, Chongqing. And there we see Ju Wenjun, she is poised, she feels that her position is good and it's the perfect time to take a break. So everyone, grab yourselves that coffee, grab yourselves a cup of tea in my case and uh, take a few sips and we will, we will be right back in a few minutes to catch those uh, gripping moments that are coming later on. So don't go away. Do you guys play chess? You want to talk about it? Yes, we do. Let's chess. do. Oh yeah. Where do you play chess at? In all the Okay. When I say chess, the first word that pops into your mind. Protect my queen. Hikaru. Intelligence. Strategy. Tactics. Toby Maguire. Oh my god, you saw Pawn Sacrifice? Yeah. If you're on Tinder and you're scrolling and someone has a chess player on their profile, is that swipe left or swipe right? Swipe right is good, right? Yeah. Then yeah. Instant swipe, swipe right. right. Okay, super into that. Right, I'm into it. Yeah. You're, you're into chess? Yeah. Okay. Probably whatever the swipe is, I don't, not interested. So you're, not in you're not interested in chess players? I'm not interested in chess players who are on Tinder. Oh, I get that. I, in fact, that checks out. If I ask you to name one chess player in the world, can you name a chess player? Yeah. No. No, I cannot. Anna Taylor Joy. Capablanca. Wow, name another one. Oh, Kasparov. Kasparov. If you name five other world champions in the next 15 seconds, I'm going to give you $50. Karpov, Spassky, Holgar, Carlson, and. Oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. Anand, Anand. Holy shit, he did it. You get 50 bucks, dude. Oh, oh, oh my God. God. We just lost God. $50. Whose idea was that?
I, I didn't think about uh, winning or defending the goal. I just think uh, we're still a strong team and uh, hopefully we can play our best. Welcome back everyone and uh, there we saw Ju Wenjun in that video showing us why she is three time back to back reigning women's world champion and at the minute in her match against Lei Ting Jie she is trailing Lei Ting Jie by a point but there is a golden opportunity for Ju Wenjun because she has the upper hand she has what is nearly a winning position on the board. Will she manage to make that comeback and level the score? Well, we will find out and Judith, in the break, we did see that Root B2 was Ju Wen Jun's choice. What do we think of her chances to get that very needed win? Well, I think there is a huge chance and if she plays the best, she would convert his uh, her advantage into victory. And she knows it, she understands it. And I think uh, Lei also understands her uh, problems and that things were not going on her way in the last four or five moves since B6 was played and the, the B file was opened up. And uh, the Rook break out from the eighth rank to the B2 second rank and the Queen from C7 from the seventh rank all the way to the third to D3. So Black's pieces are simply standing the best possible locations on the chessboard. The only bad piece in this position for black is the h7 knight. At the same time, I can't say that it's so bad because it's a prophylactical piece there. It controls pretty much the f5 opportunities break throughs for white because then bishop g5 or knight g5 can uh, be brought out. So white is in huge problem right now because it seems to me that she will have to exchange the rooks by playing rook f2. And after all, she has a pawn down before she had a huge compensation for that. But now it's more that we see that it's only a pawn down, not so much uh, compensation left. Yeah. And uh, the reason why we think that rook f2 is kind of forced is well we can eliminate them slowly one by one so king to g3 that one would be the worst one of the lot because if you play king to g3 the rook can come to e2 i don't know why my arrows are like that but they are and uh yeah. you win material exactly that's it zero one and uh there you go karakhan will win you every single game in the counter-attack. I, I exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't help but sell my opening. But you're the ambassador <laughs> of this opening. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, so that one, no, no King G3. And retreating the Bishop knight... Bishop F2 or Knight F2, yeah. Was, looked like a disaster because after Queen to D5... Oh, no, hang on. What was the move again? Actually, it's I not even a threat. You can, I think it's uh, not even a threat. Queen is also nice. Yeah, so, but you also go rook takes a2. You're not threatening a yeah. single thing. Exactly. And exactly. Yeah, you, these, this little cluster is not going to be attacking the black king. So you're just two pawns up for nothing. Um, so nope, don't want that one. And then the other one was bishop f2. And this allows a trade of queens. And also the a2 pawn is hanging. So rook f2 appears to be the best of a bad lot. Oops. Yeah, I've yeah. Rook F2 seems back. to. There you go. 
Okay, so rook f2 seems to be the best option for white right now, but it's definitely a painful one. Just it to is. see this position for white. So it's it's a huge challenge for white to try to escape in this position. Yeah. And now it's a big question whether should black capture on f2 or uh, or maybe to keep it even to play queen b1 or queen a3. Yeah. So there are a lot of alternatives I, for for black. Okay, so I, I was drawn to just capturing the rook and I feel like... Yeah, there's a simple, we'll simple chess. Simple chess, yeah. you know, she's going to be a pawn up. She has an excellent queen. It's just all about moving that knight to f8 and d7. And also we've seen her in the previous encounters. She's always taken kind of the path of least risk. But Queen B1 certainly has a lot to just uh, sing about. After all, you are doing my favorite thing. Queen takes A2, pawn grabbing. Yeah, but black, uh, white can go probably Rook B2, Queen B2, Knight F2 and attack, counter attack on C6. That's true. I mean, black is definitely better. That's not the question. The question is, out of the many opportunities she has, what is the best and whether is she, will she be able to find them and convert this advantage? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a pawn up, right? I mean, there is, there is nothing uh, white can, can say about yeah. that. It's just a pawn up. And something that is also worrying, as I just saw there in chat, was take a look at the clocks. Lating J, five and a half minutes, and they are on move 32. But bear in mind that Lating J's position is difficult, and she retreated with the bishop. Okay? Yeah, but this is a decision, rooks. you know that well i can still keep in mind if i have a rook it's more active actually i like to keep the rook myself too mm -hmm. it's it's probably better to to keep on the board the rooks okay even though if let's say queen takes f3 king f3 rook a2 and then white goes uh, rook b1 and getting into the seventh rank yeah so this this would be great for white Again, white has great initiative. Two pawns, two pawns, doesn't matter. Gets to the seventh rank and possibly captures the c6 at some point. Yeah, and if the c6 pawn falls, and again, you know, black is hampered by the fact that the knight on h7 is out of play. Um, but you know what? I have a little rule to help me make decisions in these kind of positions. And that's simply, basically, you judge king safety and whose king is safer, black's king, Looks pretty okay to me. White's king, uh, not gonna, <laughs> not gonna comment there. But uh, I would keep the queens on the board just because of this fact. Because I mean, why give white some hope? Yes. Uh, so what would you be playing? Queen d5 or queen c4? Well, queen d5. I'm not quite sure about because of um, if I go back. I, I'm slightly concerned about Rick D1, but I can see that once I do my favorite thing on the top <laughs> in the world and grab material, that a move that is very much in the air, and that's Bishop H4. Yes, indeed. And once you take the time out to deal with that threat, then Knight F8 is going to just guard the D7 point. What so yeah, queen d5. F5. Oh, f5. Yeah, you you are alive, but you're not hitting anything because the queen on f7 covers. Yes, but I'm gonna take on uh, g6, so not on e6. Mhm. Mm yeah, I'm just trying to assess like how how dangerous your idea is. So it is dangerous if I get rid of my knight. This knight is a... Remember, a knight is the king's best friend. <laughs> if, if you ever see a defensive book... A, sorry, if you ever see a book on defense and it does not have that saying, it's not a good book. Okay. Okay. 
<laughs> I, I had a friend of mine he told me he was going to write a, a book on defense and i was like yeah you've got to have that saying and you've got to have a chapter on how the knight is the king's best friend and so and he go, he thinks about it and he goes obviously he's like super strong he thinks about it and he goes mm, yeah 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 he agreed with me <laughs> after like <laughs> 10 seconds of hesitation <laughs> Yeah, so so the moves that I'm thinking about. Uh, so first of all, I, I'm also thinking about just being ruthless and capturing everything. And then okay, so back that's with how you handle it. Either, yeah, so I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking about knight on f8. You don't get mate. That rhyme is also still very much. Yeah, in but the you air. you cannot go knight f8 because I trap your bishop with f6. Ah, yeah, f6. Well, there you go. But you, I didn't get mated. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the rhyme is correct. Yeah. But I do lose a bishop. But yeah, I mean, I, I was drawn to this one. Take it all off. Oh, hang on a second. The computer says no. And well, the evaluation uh, bar said no, but okay. It wasn't. I don't see the problem. Yeah, queen I can go queen, queen takes six. f5. And I, I go queen e6. Takes rook d7. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. I'm kicking back. That's true. That's true. Hang on a second. I but hang on. I I cannot panic because the evaluation bar is just going up and down. So it's telling me one thing that I don't need to panic. And that now, now there is no f6. Now I maybe can... knight to g5 simply. Yeah. No, <laughs> the evaluation bar. <laughs> I like the way the evaluation bar is playing with us. And it's like no, keep keep on guessing. <laughs> Although it's going down in black's favor, and that's probably good enough. And in this type of position, you are two pawns up. Good enough is is enough is enough. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, key idea is that knight f six ideas is met by. Do I take bishop takes? Um. Well, there is no other choice. Takes. Yeah, and then this you can go rook d two at the end of at the end of things. No, this is a draw. That is a draw. Yeah, maybe I knight f six uh, is a problem. I and was if wondering about e six. Yeah, if ninety six. Yeah, that. No, but then okay. queen g4. Look at that. Queen g4. Oh, no. no. Yeah, no, I was king looking at... F8. Yeah, I was, I was king looking at moves like... Rick queen g8. G3. Doesn't work. Queen g3, yes. And uh, you get a perpetual because the king is weak on d6. And g3. Mm hmm well, still a lot of danger left for So if you go back to, to f5 navigate. after queen d5? So or what was f5? it? Rook d1, queen a2, f5, yes. Yeah, rook d1. But maybe you can do it this way. You can you can grab once twice and then come in with the bishop but after knight g5 i would be capturing and f6 mm, yeah yes i was banking on stuff happening on f2 but it's not enough yes it's interesting moment for uh, juve and june i mean we all know it's discovered for everyone that black is playing for a win in this game. And now she has to make a decision whether is she ready to exchange the queens or most likely she discovered that she doesn't want to exchange, but how to lay on, where to go with the queen, to c4, to d5, to c2. What yeah. is the best spot for him, for her? Yeah. What is the best spot? That is a question. Uh, um, and if you're like mega cold-blooded, like you go here, 
I just you, you mentioned a move bishop h4 and I can't shake that one off my mind. Yeah, because after uh, bishop h4 knight g5 is a threat immediately. Yeah. Material. No, okay, so that, that that loses. Wow. That that loses on the what spot. So why takes does it lose? Takes on g7. Probably takes yeah. on g6. G6. Okay, g6. Yes, of course. It takes on g6 and then and rook d7. d7. And this knight on e4 is an excellent defender. And queen f7 is coming your way. So It's crazy nope. that things are shifting in a second. If white can really reach out to f5 and uh, attack, it's a one-move game. One tempo. One tempo game, this one. So f5. This is a critical moment. Well, it definitely will go down in the books. I agree with you because it's a very complicated position. You know, black still has to tread that tightrope of uh, complications. You know, rook and, b3 uh, might be unpleasant. Ah, okay. Just the attack. Yeah. And if I step forward with the queen, g5, yeah. right? Or bishop g5. Then what about bishop g5, yeah. Knight takes. I wanted knight takes. And I guess there's still no concrete ideas. So I can, I can take it, I can give a check. King g7. Now pawn takes pawn. Then rook f3 oh. I wanted. Oh, hang on. Oh. <laughs> yeah, rook f3 draws, uh, wins it. But I just saw the evaluation bar go all the way up. Why, where would it go all the way up here? Is it to do with this? No. No. Maybe fe6. And then rook f3. Ah, Maybe it's your it. idea again. Queen takes rook and then e7. Yeah, probably. Though I play knight h4 check. And that will not work. Mm. Well, this is a very complicated position. But let's say I go back to the position that Ju Wenjun is considering. She's wondering whether she should trade off queens. Yes, no. My vibe is no. Queen d5 and just I also enter like the complications. queen c4. Queen c4? Okay. Mm -hmm. That could also be another move that she's considering while she's taking that think. Let's have a look. Queen c4. I like queen c4 Again, a lot. Not to, not to allow this uh, rook d1 idea. Yes, because yeah, if exactly. rook d1 then bishop c5 maybe works. Nice. And of course you save yourself of any of the horrible stuff that was happening after f5 and rook, f, rook d8. Yeah, yeah, this looks good. Queen c4. But these are important moments for uh, Juvenjun. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see that uh, Lighting G uh, is uh, down on time. So it's important to play the right move. It certainly is. And uh, also to bear in mind that after Knight D6, which is something to consider after Queen C4. Oh, yeah, Queen C5. Queen C5. Mm -hmm. The pin is mightier than the sword as uh yeah. J is gonna find out yeah if you drop the c5 pawn then with it you can say goodbye to all your counter chances well we're going to witness a huge time trouble i guess yeah because both players are really go down in time and uh we go back to the board we Go back and see Ju Wenjun looking at the score sheet, looking at the board, and now down Time to is six ticking. minutes. It is ticking, and seven, it will eight moves.
for Ji Wenjun to play. Then we move 33. J. And this is where the suspense gets too much for me. <laughs> like just make a move. And, and what was it like? Because you were a second for your sister, as you mentioned. What was it like watching her play? And well, well, the opening, of course, I knew what was going on because I knew what was the preparation. If there was something that any of the players uh, forgot, deviated. Uh, it was stressful, but I was not so crazy stressful, I, I remember. But I knew that, uh -huh. okay, they are going to be playing. We'll see what happens at the end. I mean, it was very clear that it ups and downs are going all the time, right? So I, I remember when the captain of the Armenian team, when they won one Olympiad after another, Petrosyan, Arshak Petrosyan was telling that, well, in the first three hours, he's not even watching the game first three mm -hmm. three and a half hours anyway after that things will the the tor turbulence is coming and everything turns out to be different so why to waste your nerves <laughs> you look around <laughs> time to time good idea good idea <laughs> but i can tell you that when it comes to critical moments like this uh, it takes a strong character to be able just to hold their nerves and especially if you're privy to what the computer engine is saying you know and you feel that your 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 person is maybe struggling taking too long on the clock there's still danger on the board i really is a tough job to be a second queen yeah, goes to d5 yeah but computer was not so much ruining my life at the time chess wise because in 96 it was just the beginning yeah so then uh, we, we were still discussing it human human brains only mm. and that is you yeah. know always going back and forth you blunder something you discover something and uh, you analyze also after the game wow what could go wrong this that so in those days it was a completely different uh, evaluation discoveries in chess now, of course, you go back to the room or already during the game, the seconds might be checking s through with the computer and they are very smart with the computer, right? Mm -hmm. So I think also a coach has to be extremely careful not to judge the player by the computer that, ah, come on, you, you had plus five and you didn't win this position, which obviously a coach will not say this, but also i see strong players how evident they can take of course this is winning and this move but if the computer would not show that move and if it would not see the bar that's also a completely other story but you tend to think that you see the bar it goes down you know that it's winning but if it's not there you could still think well maybe is there any chance maybe there is still something for white so it can be even strong players, coaches can be tricked and uh, uh, driven their their mindset and way of thinking. So it has to be very, uh, as a second, you have to be extremely careful. How do you give this information to your player that she missed something? How simple it was, you know? It's, you have to be extremely sense. It's a very sensitive uh, way of explaining, especially during a match or a tournament. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because at the same time, you don't want to ruin their confidence. You need to kind of keep everything ship shape. You have to make them believe in the impossible if it, that's what required. You just you have to calm them down. I mean, it's a tough job, and uh, well. We see that comments shaking hands is near. I'm not so sure about that because we had actually analyzed this position and neither of us are using engines because the engines are too, <laughs> too wonderful. And we thought that after F5, the situation for a human isn't that easy. And take a look at the clock times. Ju has uh, just over six and a half minutes. Lei Tingjie ticking down to just over two minutes. And I think she will play f5 because after all, what else are you going to do? I mean, I guess well, she exactly. could try rook to d7. I, that could be another choice. And well, f5 let's face on it. the board. 
Let's face it, she played g4 in the wrong moment. So if you say a, you should be saying b at the end. And this was the moment to do so, right? I mean, at least make sense of it that you play g4. Uh, so I think it was definitely the right moment to play it. And she has very little time, not much of an option. You can see that Juven June, of course, she's, she's also very stressful. You can see that it's the whole thing is boiling. Yeah. And uh, just to highlight to you, like Black's best path, according to the computer, is to go G takes pawn. And after G takes F5, go knight to G5. And after this, knight takes here, it says this is, we yeah. actually had this position on the yeah. board, but you have to find, and this is the main move to find, that queen c4 will win the game. Well, already when you have this position, you will find queen c4, but not necessarily you calculate it all the way. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. you don't play knight, you don't play gf, knight g5, because, and you see, we see e takes f5. E takes f5, and now g takes f5, and uh, well, we had this position, and we were looking at queen takes queen takes pawn, and then we saw that again, queen to e6, which is a kind of nice simplifying move, would be a mistake, as uh, the white rook suddenly gets very active, and Leighton J would have enough activity to perhaps save the game. So, but I think she she has something else in mind. Yeah, apparently this is the move, knight to f8. So queen to f5, knight to f8. I'm just checking now with the computer. That is the the path, the path to winning the game. And after rook to g1, you just simply go knight to g6. Yeah, finally, the knight from this very awkward h7 square can replace itself. That will be a big day. It will be a big day and uh, there we are going to catch up with the players because they don't have much time on the clocks and it is a tense situation. Ooh. I love this queen on a2, you know, I love it when it, it's like a blade on the second rank, but it's also going back where is the defense to do versus the f7 pawn. Yeah. And do you think that uh, Ji Wen Jun will play knight f8 or will she try to s clarify the position and go queen e6? No, queen e6 she cannot play and she knows it, that it's not enough. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure she, she will play knight f8. Maybe there is nothing really else. So that's why by eliminating the moves, that's how she it's will be finding it. It's also possible to play uh, knight to g5 or go back to the queen c4 idea. But you know, Those it's also up. it's also a very uh, typical thing that what comes to your mind at first? This is a big question. Because if, if you have the idea knight f8, of course you will play it. But if let's say you start out with queen e6, uh, then you might panic or something or you say okay knight g5 let's see that and then you you don't like it and then you don't go all the way because you don't have enough time simply so your mind your thoughts are jumping from here to there and then eventually it's very typical you're spending half of your time and then you just play something which you wanted to start with the first move hmm. you had in in mind i like win c4 also generally i think it's it, it's a very tempting move to play yeah, queen c4. It's a nice improving move, eyeing up the e4 knight. Well, Ju Wen Jun has to basically ignore her instincts to simplify the position. The best moves is just to keep the pieces all alive. Knight to f8, use the knight as a defender. And Ju Wen Jun now ticking down to three and a half minutes. And they are move 37. And yeah, for knight f8, you have to have good nerves and understanding. Oh, Ooh. no, I, 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 I warned you. <laughs> I, I didn't uh, believe it that she goes there. 
<laughs> because there's been a trend. She's been playing, you know, she simplifies and I've noticed a strength and it's also a weakness that Ji Wen Jun has is mm. that somehow or other to me, she can't hold the tension. And by the tension, I mean not nerves, but she just can't help herself and she just initiates these trades. And Queenie Six played. I mean, it is really tempting. You are two pawns up. This is but a not game for long. only two results are possible. Yeah. Uh-oh, and uh, there we see the bar just um, equalize itself. And uh, yes, it's true. She won't well, be a pawn up. Two I'm surprised, up actually. I'm surprised the, that she played this. I mean, she's still better, but it will be, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a practical decision. Okay, so yeah. what she has in mind after rook d7, she wants to go king f8 or bishop h4. Well, what does she want? Bishop h4, well, right? Rook d7, it uh, speaks for itself and there uh, we see it coming in. Um, bishop h4, I think it's a, it's a good move, right? Yeah. And, and uh, it's on the board. It is on the board. Yeah, so, 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 one thing to be aware of is that you can't go rook to a7, just to quickly highlight this, as the players really close in on move 40, where they will be getting that 30 minute bonus time, because if you go, oops, no, 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 not there, not there, not there, there was rook takes a7, <laughs> I mean, you have knight g5 is the point I wanted to make. Yeah. And knight takes knight. Well, it's going to be a problem. I mean, you have to make fancy moves such as King F1. And wow. still, the game f continues. But it Yeah, does but this is very like difficult white. to make it, to hold this game with white, actually. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, definitely don't go rook takes a7. Make a another move. Maybe King F1. After king f1, uh, first of all, I know. Uh, oh no, well, black has to take on f2 and bring the knight, I guess. Be yeah, because there is that drawing mechanism. So I just let me just put that drawing mechanism while they're thinking. Some Although, perpetual check you have in mind. Yeah, the, uh, I just wanted yeah. to show it to, to everyone. So that's okay. So say, for instance, king f1 and you go knight. Okay, just, just ignore the moves I'm going to play for white. You go knight f6 check. King F8. Okay, now here you would. Ah. Oh. Okay, how do I? How do I? You play. Let's play. Uh, not knight G5. Let's play Bishop F2. Knight F2. Yeah. You go knight G5. Yeah. Knight G4 and knight F3. Yes. Okay. So now Just you get the drawing it. mechanism. Yes. And it only works with the rook on D7 and the knight coming to F6. You go knight F6 check. King goes to f8 if you go to the corner it will be arabian checkmate so you don't want that and here okay and not that much time so let's get back to the board bishop h4 now under 20 seconds and there we see lating j playing king f1 and now she can breathe a huge sigh of relief as she's made move 40 and her position is still salvageable, although it will definitely be a big struggle for Leiting J. And now, Ju Wenjun, four minutes to make her move. There we see Bishop takes Bishop on the board. Well, there was not much of another idea. And I guess yeah, no. A5 will happen. Well, the white rook is extremely powerful. This is why we always say when for uh, weaker players, especially that when the rook is on the second or the seventh, watch out. And we can say that the white rook on the seventh is more powerful right now than the black one. But the reason is because white wants to reach out with uh, her knight from f2 to f6. So the pawns on the fifth, e5 and c5, they are very powerful. And, uh, of course, the knight wants to get to the center e4 to f6 or e4 and back to d6. 
the dream position where it was locating before. Yeah, and uh, well, you know, the, the knight on d6 is very powerful because just say one of these pawns drops, a knight on d6 will control the queening squares. And uh, these queening squares are very important to control in endgames. But now we are and over 40, so they got the yeah. extra time. Both players, and actually I'm surprised that the players are still at the board. I have this uh, idea generally that when you finish move 40, you're over time control, time travel, then it's better for you to go away from the table just to, just to, to close that part of the game. Because there were so many things happening until then, especially in the last 10 moves, last 10-12, uh, basically out of a very passive, very difficult position for black, it turned around and he be, she became active and then she clearly, we had this uh, feeling and she had this feeling for sure that she's almost winning or very close and now she's making the effort to, to catch up in the match. And now that she's staying there, I think even losing one or two minutes, it would make sense to stand up and, and get your brain a little uh, new look on the position. Yeah, um, that's the advice that I've always been given. Past move 40, get up, take that break, splash some water on your face, reset, refresh, as you mentioned. Um, sitting there, you're still bringing the emotion from that very minor time scramble, but it was intense as those emotions are still there. But both these players have uh, chosen on a consistent basis to be there present at the board. Nine but you know it can two. it can easily happen that you sit at the board you give the impression to yourself and to the people that you're you're thinking about the position but actually you think back what happened in the last few moves or you miss something you said ah okay after ah oh, why did i play queen e6 maybe i could play knight f8 so I think it's much easier to break away from all these thoughts also that what has happened and, and really to reconnect with the new position. Because it's very important that now we have a completely new situation what we had three moves ago. And, we, and specifically, when you have a change of uh, pawn structures, that is even more important, I think, to get disconnected and reconnected with the new position. Mm -hmm. So good advice there. When you have a change of pawn structure, get up. Because now if you Take see the position, if you look at the position at first, if we haven't seen the, the, the previous part of the game, we would have, or I would have the intuition that, well, white is two pawns down, but somehow she will make a draw because it's just too active. Don't you have this impression? Yeah, so for instance, I mean, the first move that I just thought about was, okay, why doesn't Ji Wen Jun just pick up the A pawn as quickly as she can? push it two squares and then the first thought was okay first of all rook a7 and then I was like yeah yeah no big deal just go rook b5 but suddenly with the knight coming to e4 yes it is a big deal well that that wasn't the right answer mm -hmm. so maybe the answer is like to put the knight to d3 and then hold on to these pawns and then rook a6 is coming yeah and, and the black king cannot activate itself the knight can right. go to g5 which is already a good start yeah so okay so the knight can come to but you're not defending the c6 pawn and if that drops you can't well, have everything no you, you can't have everything in life but that's uh the thing is though the c pawn is going to be enough of a decoy to cause trouble yeah and then white has also a pass pawn, a serious uh, one. Okay, so, so you could be off to the races at h5, rook takes his six. H4. But wouldn't you be annoyed with this type of position, having... It's not easy to play with either color. Oh. What, what, what was this? Ah, rook b6, trapping the rook. <laughs> six. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I tricked you. It's not... That's a nasty one. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so, a, so age four is not possible, but you know, it just goes to show the danger, right? So now you have to take some time out. Maybe you attack the knight. Just get your rook from out of that cage. Well, and well. yeah, the good thing is knight f4 is not possible. I mean, for black, it's good that knight f4 is not possible to rook f3. Yeah. Well, king e2. And now I'll run. Past pawns must must be pushed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. This this does feel like really. anything can happen and uh, maybe we just uh, retrace our steps because that was quite a long line so knight takes f2 yeah just to make sure that there's nothing because that was quite deep knight takes f2 that's the position we're in and i'm wondering why ji Jun doesn't just pick up the a pawn she's taking a pause she's had a think for a few minutes and but okay what happens a5. what happens if i just grab the pawn now which pawn if let's say rook c7 ah rook c7 can i run rook c6 run okay i'm gonna run a3 okay rook a6 one more time king beat king g2 and this is the idea knight g5 and i'm gonna pretend that i have your c pawn covered king g3 but i probably don't can you can you just push c6 no because knight d4 and one more time rook f2 and rook c2 yeah okay so, so that's g3. why i want to go king g3 okay and can i come forward with my king to f7 c6 and then c6 hmm not easy. No, because you know when I have a pass pawn, you have a pass pawn. It's all about calculation, so it's not so simple. And one extra pawn is no big deal here, because there are other priorities. And let's say if there is an exchange of pawns, rook c two, for example. I mean, of course, black is still better, and it's very difficult for white in many of these cases. Let's say there is an mm. exchange of pawns and you can replace your king through g6 to f5. Then again, it seems like black is uh, on the track to win the game. Yeah. So Still. for black, it's very important to get out from the, the 8th rank to the g6. Like in this position where if we go back, what is actually the, the game position? If the king would be standing on g6, black is winning. This is this is what I say also in my course. I always emphasize in my chessable course that king is an attacker in the end game. But you have to work for it to be an attacker. It has to be an active piece. So for now this is why it's, this is the the magic of white's defense that the king is very passive. This is the most important thing when you look for counterplay. Mhm. Mm and uh, whilst you were talking, Judith, it seemed like the penny had dropped for Ju and Jun. We saw her lean back. She gave a sigh of frustration as she understood that this is not that easy for her. And we are expecting her to push the A pawn. Don't really see any other alternatives. Maybe she can run with the H pawn. But it is now a bigger task than Ju and Jun had anticipated as the players have passed move 40. They're now in the end stages and as I speak, A5 played and uh, Ju Wan Jun looking to reset herself, just refocus and get ready for the long haul. And I think it's the perfect time to for us 
to readjust, re refocus, because we are going to be looking at an in-game grind. So far, Ju Jun has not been successful in managing to convert those small advantages in previous games. But this time, she does have a two-pawn advantage. Will Glating Jay's counterplay be enough? Well, right, we will find out winning. after the break. Hey everybody, it's Danny here, and as you may know, chess.com and Sorry, Chessable I, I are do this thing where I, like, one, I, I breathe. And I'm here to show you how you can make your chess.com and chessable one in just a few clicks. To start, let's log in and connect our chess.com account. I just scroll right here above the browser and click log in. Scroll down and click continue with chess.com. Now, if you're already logged into chess.com, it's just gonna ask you if you wanna approve that connection. I'm gonna say yes, sir. But after approving, it'll bring you right back to the Chessable homepage. Now, the Puzzle Connect feature can be found under Tools and you click Puzzle Connect. Now, what that does after you type in your username is it's gonna pull positions from the games you played on chess.com, create your very own personalized chessable course, and then quiz you with the positions where you may have missed the best move. And the more you play on chess.com, the more games it will have to quiz you as long as your account stays connected. It's pretty sweet, and it's gonna help you get better learning from the mistakes in your games. Yes, this is a pro feature at chessable, but if you go to chessable.com slash link, you can get 30 days of pro for free. Hello everyone and we are back and as you might have heard, <laughs> well, the action has me on tenterhooks so much so that it leaves me out of breath. 
<laughs> but anyhow, let's uh, dive right through into what is happening on move 41 between Leiting J and Ju Wen Jun. And they are there in the new location of Chongqing, which actually, incidentally, is one of the world's mega cities. So I think it's actually the largest city in the world by population. It's also called the City of Fog and it's also called the mountain city and also it's such a big metropolis that even the locals get lost <laughs> well there is a tough end game going on here in this huge city a lot of tension which i'm sure people players are feeling right there right now because it's a very crucial game of the match it is say. incredibly crucial. Good. It's a golden opportunity. But I, the, the thought did occur to me, though, during the pause, is that, you know, we've been talking about things from Ju Wen Jun's perspective. But of course, Lei Ting Jie doesn't know about the bar. She doesn't know that her position can be saved if she plays very accurately. All she sees is she's two pawns down. Black has a runaway A pawn, runaway H pawn. Will she be feeling somewhat dejected or is she inspired by the fact that her rook is on the seventh row and she can start to nibble on the c6 pawn? Well, basically it's clear that uh, she she should have the feeling that she has, she has good chances come to play in this endgame. But now, for example, it's a critical uh, move because she has to decide whether is it a priority to capture the pawn first on c6 what we just looked at before the break and to stop the pawn but the pawn will go all the way to a2 that's what she would allow for uh, juven jun or it's more important to stop the a pawn to be pushed and to let's start with, to go rook a7 but after rook b5 then you have to be protecting the c5 so you're also losing time and it's not so easy to calculate and evaluate the differences between the two. I mean, we know that the black pawn will be pushed uh, much further if uh, white is not playing rook a7. At the same time, it's not clear to, it's, and it's not easy to understand which gives the better drawing chances for white. Mm -hmm. And even uh, I would say that even you can go with knight e4. I mean, that can also be something to consider. And only after a4 to play, let's say, uh, rook a7. And then black does not reach to a2, so black should be playing rook b4, let's say. And then I say that I want to go with my knight to d6, this fantastic place. And after that, I want to play rook a7, capture the c6. And then I will have a great pass pawn once the c6 pawn is uh, taken so there are that's, different alternatives that's uh, very true but uh, i was there inspired but the thing is though lating j can't just be obsessed with this c pawn because black does have two runaway pawns the a pawn and the h pawn so they move quite quickly as well. It's incredible. Pawns only move one square, but somehow in end games, they get double the momentum because you know, H pawn is now barreling down the board. And but okay, let's say if we, if we take a look, what happens if I go to K6? Okay, just to. Uh, okay, I'm, I grab I'm a person on with C6. a one track mind. Okay, yes. Okay. I, and I go H3. H3. King yes. G1. King G1. Uh, I wasn't sure whether I should be going root B1 first. Uh, okay, so now, okay, now I need to... Okay, this one needs to be promoted ASAP. So I'm, let's bring in this guy. Yeah, I think this is the move and this is the key that you can bring your knight defending the H3 and then you go root B1, root B2 and then yeah. push it all the way to checkmate. Yeah. So this is not possible for white. Yeah, that that is... Uh, it's certainly slow. one way that white is too slow, as you mentioned. So going back to the position, so it's a5. This is the thing that's critical. Cause okay, so so let's say uh, rook a7. Of course, that's the most logical move oh, to sorry. stop. Sorry. To stop black to to be able to push the a pawn. Mm -hmm. 
uh, rook b5. Oh, we have a move. On the board. She has played rook a7. Mm -hmm. So rook a7 again, rook b5, the only move that I can see to defend the a-pawn and hold on to this two-pawn advantage. I don't see anything else. Well, that seems to be the most logical because rook a2 is also sensible. Oh, yeah. But that is not attacking the white pawn. It's only focusing about her own pawn to support playing a4, a3 and maybe also to push the other pawn on the h file. And uh, it, it, it can be also possible, but I think knight e4 now may be stronger. So after a4, knight c3 is possible. After knight e4? Yeah, or knight d3 was also possible, maybe. Knight d3. Yeah. Maybe knight d3 is very interesting. Because knight b4 is a threat, so a4 is not really possible to knight b4 also. Mm. <clears throat> and also knight f4, just in case. Yeah, because I was going to suggest, you know, your plans of always, like, running down with the h5 pawn. H h pawn looks very good. Uh, also, knight can join into the game. Very complicated. And also, you white has to be flexible as well. You know, white has to be prepared to switch from rook a7 to going rook c7, if need be, to attack this c6 pawn. So white's counterplay is very much based on better rook, better knight, and the ability to attack the c6 pawn. Yes, absolutely. That's all about the defense what white has. So, okay, mm -hmm. rook a2 I don't go. I go rook b5 after all. Rook a7, rook b5. Rook b5. Okay, and, now, and now knight d3. The knight needs yeah. to be stable in its defense of c5 yeah, actually, and d5. Knight e4 is a more logical move at first. So this is interesting whether is it really knight d3 what has to be done or how is knight e4? Because the, it's very easy to go wrong with white, I think, with knight e4. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because it can be destabilized, like, oh, hang on, like this. But knight after that, knight, knight f6. Yeah, and then you run to the center. Are oh, you no. running there or you go king h8? Oh. King h8 apparently is the way forward, just according to the evaluation bar. Yes, because after king h8, first of all, you have a very stable g5 knight, which covers the most important square h7. And also after this, rook c5 is a threat because king on f8 would be placing it wrongly with knight d7 fork. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we have rook b5 on the board. We do have rook b5 on the board. And again, big moment. Knight yeah. to d3, best way to defend the c5 pawn and the e5 pawn. And of course, Lady J has to do this. She has to find this move. Knight e4 will get destabilized by knight to g5. Okay, so after knight d3, which probably so will be fine, but it's not so tempting to play knight d3, you know? I mean, you really have to understand the position well to be playing this. But it's helped by the fact that the pawn is on c5, is under attack. Because you can't you can't really play anything else because rook takes c5. Yeah, and but that, you might as well shake hands. But at the same time, after knight e4, knight g5, knight f6, king h8 is kind of not a human uh, way of thinking. That's true. The king... Okay, let's have a look at this position because, okay, knight g5 I think is very normal. But knight, because I, I came up with it by myself, and if I can come up with it by myself, but I was I was kind of running with the king to the center, and why is that a big mistake? Ah, probably because of rook a6, and you cannot take on c5. Yes, yes, and that's why you need to study your tactics at home for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, in, in between some uh, theoretical endgames and calculations. <laughs>
<laughs> a little, o- little spice it up with a little opening. <laughs> and that's it. You have got the recipe to becoming uh, a grandmaster. Uh, you can um, use a little more spices than that, but... <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, <laughs> Rook A6. Yeah, after Rook I mean, A6. But even this type of position, I mean, how if the king comes forward, and I remember your plan of trying to like snake king the king to f5. f5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will be very happy to have the king on f5. The only problem is that you might have uh, your strong pawns by now. Pawn, ah, yes. pass pawn on c5. So you go uh, rook c8 and simply push. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if I can give you everything but the problem is also my rook doesn't have an anchor so that what i'm panicking about because sometimes i literally panic about future is like this, this pawn will march itself to c7 and then rook moves like rook b8 will come okay and we have a move knight d3 on the board knight I, <laughs> these two Precise. are good and they're and they're very accurate when they need to be they take i mean did you notice that both sides reached move 40 they did not blitz out any moves they just took their time and they considered nice decision. all options excellent decision from lating j and 93 the end is nigh <laughs> says our producer bigfoot i say no the end is not nigh we are gonna be in for i think a few maybe half hour one hour of exciting chess as a late j fights to save this position yeah the, uh, now the question is it seems to me that black cannot save her pawn on c6 there is no way so if let's say knight g5, which is the most logical continuation, white goes rook a6. <clears throat> okay, let's dive in. And rook a6, yes. And for white it's very good that after rook b3, white has uh, the powerful good move with the king to e2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is very important that this rook here can be met by king e2. Also, white has another tactical trick up their sleeves as well. Like we saw this idea of rook b6, just uh, forcing a trade of rooks with the right time. Yes, but rook b6 yet, I think it will be not so a uh, big problem for black because king f7, because my rook is protected on b5. Yeah. So, but it might not be, we saw it. So say for it, so we went into a line where we just age yeah. five, Rick takes, and then say for instance here, this was a big mistake, and then you can see the evaluation bar yeah. shooting up in White's favor, and we fell for it once, we won't fall for it again because Rook B six. I mean, if something like this would happen, H four Rook B six, the match is over. Exactly. It's, and it's not only because the game would be won for White; it's because psychologically you just cannot digest some thing like that at this stage of the match to to blunder such a huge one mm -hmm. and uh we have a move from ju engine she has played knight g5 the players are following our analysis and we're expecting leading j she needs to get counter play she can't rest easy she has to attack this c6 pawn so rook a6 is a nice move looks at the a5 pawn keeps guard over that one and attacks the c6 but let's say i have a question i go h5 after uh, rook a6 mm -hmm. i go h5 and after rook c6 let's say we are not blundering with h4 but give a check on b1 first yep and where do you go with your king that is the question it's as always g2 or e2 or F2. Um. Actually, this knight on D3 stands extremely well, much better than I even thought. Because after King G2, for example, look at that, or wherever you go, there is no check on B2. But more importantly, if H4, I can go Rook B6 anyway, 
And the black rook cannot go to the c file because it covers also the c1 important square. That is true, but at the same time, you do have like moves like rook to d1, and you yes, cover. Yes, but but can't I play c6? You can, but uh, rook d2 first. But yeah, rook d2 rook d2 2 or h3 or want. h3 or h3. Maybe h3 is more powerful. H h3, yeah, h3 is much more powerful because yeah, you have to stand ground. Rook and, a6 okay, on so the board. We should go back because Rick A6 played. So still a, a, a narrow margin for Leighton J to hold this position. Rick A6, but she's found it so far. And now it's a race. It's all to do with timing and uh, Black needs to hit that initiate button and start moving the H mm. pawn up the board. Because if you don't do that, I mean, can you can you play it slowly with king king f seven, king g six, and but the problem is king. anyway rook c six king g six rook b six. So black yeah, has exactly. to look after this this problem. This is uh, the biggest problem for black. After rook c six, he has to lose time. Yeah, by moving the rook. Yeah, you know, I'm just wondering. So, if, so step one, you do this. Step two, you get out of dodge, and then the king comes somewhere and still okay, white six. is so quick or a6 yeah rook a6 and still c6 is coming and the knight on d3 as you highlighted just taking away the square from the rook. Beautiful, beautiful mm. uh, uh, place for the knight, and very unexpectedly, it's just so powerful. Defending, attacking, having the f4 square, which can be important at some point. Very nice yeah. square for the knight, and uh, unexpected. Some, good. Yeah, I mean that's just one of those things, right? And it would be really frustrating for Ju Wan Jun if she does not win this game because it will feel like she's losing the thread of the match even with she cannot win and yeah but we can say that it was not so easy to convert it i mean you needed good technique for that of course it's a very serious missed opportunity and she has to know it and un understand it that it does not come easy to have such a chance with the black pieces in the Karakan at this point of the match but uh, I mean, even if it's a draw, she gained something in the second half of the match. Psychologically, she's there. She put pressure. Tomorrow, she plays with the white color. Uh, uh huh. Keeps the tension. And okay, that's, a, that's interesting to hear because I would have thought that if she doesn't win this psychologically, she's like busted because you know she had such a good good opportunity. She's not putting it away. Everything is falling into Leighton J's lap. Yeah, but I think what she should take away from this game if she's uh, going to make a draw, that she made a surprise, it worked out well, and from a difficult position, she was able to turn around and create the winning position. So if she could do it mm. today, in the next five rounds, she will have one more opportunity to create that, and she can equalize the match. That would be my way of thinking let's say as a coach or i would say or even for myself of course you have to be a positive uh, thinker from this respect but i mean she gained also quite a lot in this game not only losing the the half a point which she which she's not going to get yeah uh, yeah i i i think yours is the correct way but i suspect that right now she's thinking i'm two pawns up <laughs> <laughs> and like eight times out of, out of ten, these endings, two pawns up, would be winning and easily winning. And instead, nope, still a big fight on her hands. And yeah, but yeah, tomorrow is a new chance. And one always has to be optimistic. One uh, can never let that dark little voice well for now chest thoughts. For now, she has to focus here how to create her chances, how to give difficult moments for 
for uh, Lei at this point, how to torture her a little bit more. Even if she is going to get to a draw, she has to fight for it as difficult and make it as difficult as possible. But she went down again in time. So you see, there mm -hmm. are situations where we see when one or the other has more time and sometimes quite a big advantage, 20, 25 minutes more for one side. But now again, uh, uh, oh. Juven Jun went down in time and activates and her king. She does activate her king, but I feel that that was not the path, even though it's very natural, very logical. I mean, I do feel that h5 is the move that puts some pressure on Leiting J. And uh, thankfully, Ju Wenjun, she's sharp. She spotted that trick, which ha had me worried because I felt like if she lost to that one, I think uh, that would have been a heartbreaking finish to this game. So Rook B3 played. King is going to come up to E2 to defend the knight on D3. Well, basically, Juven Jun, she could uh, possibly take over the match in game three and four, right? She had the upper hand, she was uh, pressing quite hardly, and then somehow she couldn't break through. And then in game five, uh, she collapsed at one point, practically. And she ended up herself uh, getting into extremely passive, very positionally almost lost position, which she lost also. But now maybe she has uh, the next wave of trying and maybe this game she puts pressure, she's not winning, maybe tomorrow again. But of course she has to collect all her energy for the second half of the match to try to not only to get the opportunity, great chance, but also to be able to convert it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can see the emotions on Ju Wenjin's face. She's... Uh, saying to us she is not happy and uh, Leiting J on the other hand completely focused completely ready she feels that this is now within her grasp to draw and the question is how narrow is that path King E2 seems to be very logical you can also give in a check and also move the knight back that's what I'm checking but to me King E2 I think I would play this very quickly. Well, definitely King E2 is, uh, is the move, I believe. I'm now wondering and thinking of some tricky things. What happens if Rook D6? Can White sacrifice something after Knight E4 to play C6? Or that's not the case? Oh, wow. Yeah, you can sacrifice. And uh, we see King E2 on the board. Yeah, that would be very scary after c6. I don't think I would even touch your rook, and I am satisfied. So you think that list. it's a poisoned rook? Yeah, completely poisoned. I'm going rook c3. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to allow two passed pawns, two connected passed pawns on the sixth. No, 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 no. Not for me, thank you very much. And, okay, so we didn't see that happen. Instead, yeah, we king saw e2. King, king e2, which is way more natural. And again, question for Ju Wanjun. What does she do? Does she push the age pawn? Is there any threats? I'm just wondering whether she should push the age pawn, whether she should move the king to the game, king up the position. I, I don't know. So it could go a4. Mm -hmm. Where do you go? Rook a6? Rook a6, get behind. A3. Pass pawns. Yeah. And can I throw in a check? This is what I yeah, want Yeah, anyway, I wanted to go to g6. Okay. And... And if I go c6, you're going to go rook c3. Well, I don't have much of a choice, I must say. Yeah. So c6, rook c3, c7. Okay, and this we, is and what I'm some... expecting. That black wants to exchange the pawns, the, his her a3 pawn to the c, and then somehow activate her king to f5, and then she's a pawn up. She's pressing, having a pass so, pawn, so and that can be second. interesting. This this could be something that we mm -hmm. see. Hang on, 
the rook, so let's just put the king on e3. And what do we no, think about this position? Rook c4 rook or something first. But now the d3 knight is not very well placed because I have I will have a very stable post for my king on g5 on f5. Very beautiful knight on g5. Engine doing that annoying zero 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 thing. <laughs> <laughs> it does many times this annoying zero 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 thing yeah <laughs> but this is the key position actually that both players will be visualizing and yeah it's the computer this says, is not fun <laughs> this is not fun for white no it's not fun for white and i, I love, the, love the way the computer is just like yeah just a draw what, what were you thinking but uh, in terms of you know human play i mean it's not going to be easy and of course, let's not forget that there's h5, h4 coming your way. Okay. And I think this is what Jiron Jun has planned as she pushes the a pawn forward. And expecting rook a6. And Leiting J down to 14 minutes on the clock. Oof. It just goes to show in games are so important. And when you were like seconding or when you were training for the World Championships tournaments, in general, how much time did you dedicate to the end game? Well, when I was a kid, I was spending a lot of time on end games. First, uh, I was uh, studying pawn end games, of course, then uh, a lot of rook end games at the age of seven, eight, nine, something like that. And uh, so that was always my strongest end game part because I was looking at it so much when I was a child. And also later, of course, the bishop end games, like the basic theoretical end games, one pawn, two pawns, several pawns. I remember very well that I was uh, studying the knight end games. Of course, one pawn, you study the winning positions, drawing patterns or knight against pawns, but also, for example, the knight uh, four pawns versus three, how to win, what are the important uh, milestones in such an endgame, what you have to look after, and also queen endgames, that was always the most challenging and most difficult, but I always felt that endgames are extremely important uh, part of the game, and then for some time, openings took over my life, uh, and all the other things like middle game especially but also end game became very much in the back round of my studies and then later on uh, I started to work on end games again because first of all I loved them very much and secondly I knew and understood that if you don't remember your theoretical knowledge on end games then you put yourself in an extremely difficult position uh, when you play in fifth hour sixth hour and if you don't remember you don't know the theoretical uh, ideas then you just simply don't know what to simplify to or or mm -hmm. you don't because most of the end game simply you cannot calculate you have to have a good feeling or knowledge for it at least to evaluate and once you can evaluate it well then you can make sure that whether you remember the concrete patterns or you have to figure it out and, and then I went back to study much more on the rook and bishop, uh, rook and game, rook knight against rook. So I always think that it's very important and uh, probably you know it that I'm a huge fan of uh, composers. So to solve uh, game kind of uh, studies, Paul Banco was one of my trainers. So I, I studied a lot with him on that. And uh, because I think when you solve uh, composers' uh, studies, then you can sharpen your, uh, your calculation skills a lot. Also, you can sharpen very well your defensive skills, which is very important in a, in a first endgame, for example. So, and also you work a lot uh, when you solve problems, uh, your calculation in both yeah. ways, attacker and the defender. Yes. And uh, there you mentioned that you did a lot of uh, studies in compo uh, sorry in game studies and also studying a lot of end games, but on average, I'm going to put you on the spot, Judith. I, how many hours 
what, what, from from being a kid, did you study on chess? Oh, on chess altogether? Oh, no, and on the no, end game, because now we're in end games, yeah. Because um, it's quite nice to quantify. Like, Well, when I was a kid, an hour, a few hours in a day, I think. There were periods okay. when when uh, I had uh, two three hours per day, easily went on uh, solving and and study and games with this, probably you know this yellow book series in Russian of Averbach, that mm-hmm. was uh, that 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 was the the main books on end games which I studied also the end game encyclopedia. And of course, we were very happy when we found some mistakes in the book that, wow, this is not true what they say, the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, and nowadays, then... it's a different story because up to seven pieces, you go to the, the end game database, the table base, and then you just know the, the evaluation. But just because you know the evaluation, it doesn't mean you understand the end game itself, right? So once uh, I was already much later, uh, I don't know, in 2000 something, when I worked a lot on understanding the queen versus rook end game. And that was very interesting because I understood that if you know what you're doing, you know the, the pattern of defense and you play against someone who is with the queen and has no idea, then most likely you are going to make a draw because there is a, at some point, if you make a good defense, there is at some point you have to come back with your queen to c2 when the opponent's king on e8 and that is a kind of a tzuk swung but it's not an obvious tzuk swung but in few moves you figure out that it's good because you can force black into unharmonize the rook and king and then already you end up in that winning position so that was yeah. very interesting but i understood i played it i i was training with almashi at the time and uh, he was telling, ah, all this is complete nonsense, you know, this rook and bishop and queen. I said, okay, but just in case, let's study. And then I went to play the World Cup, I think. And then I just made the rook bishop endgame such an easy draw for like 70 moves. I was playing like this against Nisipiano. And I was just telling him, you see, you see, this is why we have to understand and know these endgames. <laughs> and you beat Lenia Dominguez as well in a that was already later. Yeah, that was 2011. Yeah. That that was also a moment when I knew and understood very well the ins and outs of the end game. But rook and bishop versus rook can be extremely tricky when we have no pawns, right? So usually you train to have the on the side either on the first uh, row or on the last row, eighth row. But when it comes to the side, the same thing, mirroring, it's not so easy to remember the pattern. And that's mm-hmm. how I got confused with the Dominguez, that I knew that I have a winning position. I never let it go slip out of my hand. But it took me time to discover that what exactly how I win when it was on the side. And well, that was a huge match, one of my biggest uh, match uh, of my life because it's very tense, very interesting, and a uh, big match with eight games. Yeah, I remember, and I think you won, right? I won that match, yeah. Yeah, mm. you won, yeah, because I, <laughs> I remember the commentator was biased for you, and I was also biased, you know, even though I had, you know, it was, <laughs> I was like, come on. <laughs> and you had to win from uh, a must win situation. Yes. And in the meantime, we do have a move from Leighton J. She's moved the knight to f4 just to keep an eye over these critical g6 and h5 squares. Yes, this is important, uh, or it can be important, and it's very logical that she does not want to allow the black king to activate itself towards to f5. Because if we can keep the king on f7, it can be very useful. So I like this move very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, has ideas of, well, driving the king back as well. Like rook a7 is now in the air. So I. W- I would be attracted to moves like rook c3. Yes, but after Just rook c3, <laughs> maybe rook a7 check. Yeah, that's uh, true. King, so, c8, the, king e8, c6. 
King A7 and then Camus the King and then C6. Ah, yes, of course. And then we're going to go into that end game. Yeah. Not an easy end game by any means. King to D. No. Mm. Well, Lady J. She has uh, just over eight minutes, but it's Ju Wen Jun's move, and she has under fourteen, which is coming down to fourteen minutes on the clock. Wow. Oops. And uh, interesting. Well, uh, I mean, how to keep how to keep the game alive though? You, you the, the key thing for Ju Wen Jun is she can't make life easy for Leighton J. She has to give her choices. And but I think. I think she Lei has the feeling that she will able to hold this. I think she's very optimistic on that. Looking at her. You know, I I can predict their moves. I've I'm starting to understand their styles quite a bit. I'm their weaknesses and their strengths. But I cannot read their body language for the life of me. <laughs> I mean, to me like Ju Wen Jun just looks confident whereas but I think uh, she Ting Jay I think for now she she sees that okay I will not be able to win. How the earth I'm going to create chances for myself now. This is what I'm I'm reading. Well, I see the position also, but by her body language is also like okay, so what to play? How to now, try now, to see, now I'm thinking that she she, she looks like okay, right. It looks like somehow she just detached herself, relaxed, and then, okay, right now she is prepared to dive back into the position. And uh, I mean, the thing is about these endings is that you have to keep them as obscure as possible for your opponent. You have to make it complex. And I'm just thinking about certain moves. H5 sadly has been prevented and I've been itching to play H5 for a long time. And if you do make moves like rook b4, well, white will easily respond with king e3. If no, you no, 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 no. You can't go to king e3, rook e4. No, oh, no, no, no. Oh. No, well, you can't you go, go there. There, there. there you go. You have to, the knight will come back. But I think you go, well, either you, yeah, probably you just go back. You just go back and then you're going to have to go rook b3 well, again or... Or the thing is, I have the feeling that Black is also not believing in her winning chances. At the same time, if you don't believe in your winning chances, then you have very little chance to win. At least you should be giving the impression that, yes, I mean, if Karpov is playing this kind of position, you know, he would give the impression that, of course, I'm winning. It's only a matter of time. You know, and let's play the cat and mouse game. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, will, he, will he give the imp impression of winning after the whole story that's unfolded? Like, for instance, if he was winning and then he's let that slip and now he's having to... Of course, to, he always, he, he he still... always gave. He always gave the impression that he's playing for a win, he's winning. Unfortunately, uh -huh. I remember very well my story with him. Exactly, it was the September 11. And he was torturing me for seven hours. And uh, he had a better position. Than, I think it was some Catalan kind of game. And it was drawish. And, and I had this feeling that I saved the game. And then again, he pressed. And then I saved. And then I got this position where uh, he had a rook knight and, uh, and three pawns on one side. And I also had a rook and knight, but I only had two pawns. So I understood that it's a draw and I was I had a good setup and we were playing and we just turned uh, to the seventh hour. We had an extra half an hour each. I think at that time we didn't have bonus time. And then he was like acting the dead drawish endgame practically as he would have great chances in the game. And it was good. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was playing fast, then he made the move, I was thinking, then he went around and going back and forth and doing this and doing that. And time was passing, and even in the in repeating moves, he was doing it so convincingly that at the end, little by little, he already had chance. I had to be more accurate. I was already not accurate, and I just lost it. 
And I was like, it's incredible. How can I lose this dead draw endgame? But he was sitting there giving the impression that, okay, maybe it's a drawish game, but obviously I'm going to win this. <laughs> <laughs> and I really felt as a mouse to be honest yeah. it was definitely a cat and mouse game which I remember forever yeah no, I, yeah it's, it's terrible to be in the hands of uh, one of those end game grinders and you know they they know you know that they're going to keep the game alive and that they're going to keep on going and you have to earn every single point Whew, it's, and you uh, have to anyway it's you have to understand that just because a game is or the position is draw it doesn't mean that the game is draw it the position is draw you still have to make your work and draw the game yeah absolutely and yeah no it just uh, definitely is going to be like that well, Ji Wenjun, she is taking her time, but she can't take too long because uh, she has just under eight and a half minutes left to play the whole game and still decisions have to be made. Is both players now eight minutes? Now I was wondering about that in game where the A, the a pawn and the C pawn has uh, left the board. I was just wondering when should you go into this end game? Should you go into this end game when your opponent doesn't have so much time? And uh, there we have a move, and she has played Rook C3. And uh, Leiting J, she is fighting for survival here. Will she get, well, first of all, let's have a quick look at how she got to the World Championship. Challenger Lei Qingjie is trying to become the 18th women's world champion in history and the 7th from China. She would join a prestigious list that includes Xi Jun, Ho Yufan and her opponent in this match, Ju Wen Jun. Lei Qingjie has already made history several times. She is just one of seven women to become a grandmaster as a teenager. In 2021, Lei won the first ever women's Grand Swiss and she did it by a whopping one and a half points, starting the event an amazing eight out of nine. With a round to spare, no one could mathematically catch her. That dominant victory put Lei into the candidates tournament, one step shy of the world championship. Three short match victories and she would be the challenger. Lei won them all and she never even needed a tie break. For her first battle held in Monaco, Lei faced off against former world champion Maria Muzichuk. Lei won immediately in the first game, then secured three draws to advance to the semi-final. Lei wasn't done with the Muzichuk family yet. Next came Anna Muzichuk, Maria's older sister. The players started with three draws, partially flipping the script from the previous round. But the match ultimately produced the same result. Lei won the fourth game and with it, her second match. The final move to China where Lei faced her compatriot Tan Zhongyi. Like Maria Muzichuk, Tan Zhongyi is a former world champion. Tan greeted Lei coldly in the very first game, delivering Lei's first loss of the candidates. How would Lei deal with her first adversity of the qualification cycle? By taking over the match and never losing again. She won game two, and game four and game five. Her third win clinched the match with a game still on the schedule. Just like in the last round of the Grand Swiss, it wasn't needed. Now Ju and Jun awaits. Has the three-time champ finally met her match in Lei Tingjie? I, I didn't think about uh, winning and what a match it's been so far. We've seen Lei Tingjie put pressure on Ju Wenjun. We also saw Lei Tingjie score the first win in the match in game five, thereby overpowering her counterpart and also her, the world champion. And there we see Ju Wenjun. She is a pawn up, but the position is very difficult to win. And 
even better than that. The players are treating us to what is going to be an in-game fest with not so much time left on the clock. We are going to see a lot of fast action here as the players get ready. Lating J still has a big job ahead of her as she fights to keep her chances for the Women's World Championship alive. I think the most important thing now for uh, Juve and June is somehow to keep the tension to to play on and play on and play on. Just give the opportunity to make mistakes for like Len uh, Lay because uh, they both know that it's very drawish objectively, but. Uh, it's another story how you're going to be really making all the way until draw the game because you can always go wrong. I mean, in one moment you have to go with your knight from f4 and suddenly the black king breaks out from f7 to f5. It can be still a draw. So most of the time such a position, it's not lost that you blunder in move in one move. But it can easily be lost that you make some inaccuracies like in this position you can go king d2, you can go, I mean, okay, it's black to move, but let's say if it's white to move, you have several options to make it or continue the game with rook a7, with king d2, with c7 or whatever. But in, when things go wrong and you make some inaccuracies, it means that in, in a move that you can play four moves, which still keeps the draw, the next move only or five moves later, it's only three moves. Then another 10 moves, you have the only move to make a draw. So it's like little, yeah. little, little changes. And then suddenly you realize it that when you have the only moves to make and you don't find it, you can go wrong and even lose the game. So this is the way I think Juve and Jung can win the game. Just play on, fight it out, go, go, go. And then let the light to make mistakes. Exactly. And I... I I really like this last move, King E7. Nothing has changed in the position. If uh, Lei Ting J wants to play C7, well, it will be the king that is catching up on that pawn. And still, the, ten, the time is ticking down, and I feel that uh, Ju Wen Jun will leave this endgame with those uh, the A pawn and C pawn off the board. She will leave that until the very last moment. Sorry, I have to share with you this beautiful checkmate, how black can lose oh, yeah? in two moves. Yeah. Rook A8, with the idea okay. that I want to force things with C7, and then black goes Knight F7, just by attacking, right? The E5. Sorry, what was the move that you want black to play? Well, not I don't want, but I want to show it that knight f7, knight g6 mate. Ah, uh, knight f7, knight g6. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I thought you had said some... Yeah, that is a very nice, uh, definitely, something that black should not do. That's uh, not help mate your own king. So, no, you don't yeah, want that. I, but... I understand that's not the goal for black, but actually rook a8, I think it can be a sensible move because if I want to force somehow black to capture my pawn on c6 i would be taking on a3 and the black king is very passive still back on e7 and yeah, this is a nice way to clarify the position right now when the players have five minutes left because i feel if a good thing for ju and jun would be to have this end game but say when both players have two minutes left on the board uh, on the clock rather and then that way there's a, a higher chance of a and some inaccuracies. And what are we going to see? Are we going to see Rook A8? Yeah, it's White's choice now, right? I mean, uh, White can also go in the game position to go Knight G6, but Black's idea is to go Kings D8 and C7, possibly. Yeah. At the same time, it's a good question whether uh, can Black go King D8, King C7, because after that, maybe it will be easier to, after exchanging the pawns on a3 and c6 the h6 pawn can be more vulnerable mm -hmm. and but, uh, i guess there's also a question right what happens if the knights come off the board is this just an easy draw for white well it depends uh, where the black king is standing also if the black king can reach out to c7 then uh, maybe and also have the h pawn it can be some tzuk for white I think, and, uh, but uh, of course, as, 
as they say, all the Rukant games are drawn, but King D2. Yeah, King D2 on the board. Well, the Rook has to move. Oh, hang on a well, second, it doesn't have to move, there can be a check. You can play yeah, I mean, Knight, knight e4 can be a check, but the idea is for white to play knight e4, king e2, and after that, already rook a7 is threatening because the e6 pawn is not protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, rook some, somewhere, rook c4, rook c5, yeah, maybe, maybe after rook... all. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not quite sure where, but uh, your idea is that here, attacking the knight and if you're careless with where you put your knight so say for instance it's difficult to be careless but okay i'm going to try it but say like knight e7 knight e2 would uh, of course lose on the spot to knight f3 check and then the pawn on e5 would fall off so that's why you need to make moves like rook a7 check knight g6 okay well we have some moves Rook c4 on the board, and time is ticking, both of them under five minutes. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> all, all rook endings are drawn, yes. Well, yes. Didn't, didn't you learn that one when you were a kid? Yeah, 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 I did. But uh, no, 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 I, I, uh, I lost a rook and pawn ending, and everyone turned to me and said, how could you lose oh. a drawn... Rick and Paul, do you not know your basics? And they, they made me feel so ashamed oh. that I went and got out the John Nunn Rick and Paul endings. Oh, this is Spielman. Well, <laughs> John, one of these end game books. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I will, I will master them for you. So actually it was good that they were complaining about your knowledge. <laughs> if, if, this, if this is what uh, happened afterwards. Yeah, but, I mean, shame is a powerful motivator, right? Yeah, <laughs> nothing but John Nunn has, has fantastic books. Mm -hmm. He does, he does. Incredible Absolutely. books. I'm not saying that all of them are so practical. I remember back, uh, you know when? 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, back in 91. And we played in the same tournament. And after the tournament, he came to Hungary to train with us. And he gave, he gave in an envelope a position. And it was like crazy because in those times he was working with computers already. And it was a rook pawn versus rook and the pawn was like C on C3 or something. So you thought that, okay, it's winning or drawing. No, it was a mutual Tsukzwang position. So that was the first time I, uh, I, I understood that this rook end games and end games with computers, it can be crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I remember when he was a captain of the men's team in Batumi 2018. It was quite funny because he would spend all his time on the computer, like just looking up studies and seeing whether they were cooked. And cooked means if they have like alternative solutions. <laughs> and, there's, and this was a big hobby for him. So yeah. definitely he's a fantastic player though. Yeah. Yeah, and very nice person too. So, knight d3 back. Doesn't change that much. The king is uh, far away from the entry route to f5. And at the same time, the knight protects the e5 pawn. What next? Knight f3 check. Yeah, it's possible maybe that knight f3, king e3, knight d4. What do you think about that? Sorry, knight f... Knight f3, king e3, and knight to d4. Yep. That's uh, definitely something to consider. And my first question is, what happens... Okay, I seven. was going to fall... If I was going to, yeah, you can't, uh, just to highlight, you can't go rook takes pawn because that would lose to knight c2 check. And uh, the fork would be deadly. So rook a7. The king is going to move to d8. Mm. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just moving it closer. Yeah. Yeah, because actually I like the knight on d4, to be honest. Hmm. 
and Juan Jun ticking to just over two minutes on the clock. And the position as it stands is a. Uh, they get 15 minutes no. after 60, right? No, no, no. no. Ah, from now Which on, is, there is nothing? From now on, there is nothing. Oh. The players are playing on the bonus Body time. time. And th exactly. Wow. And, well, no, no uh, knight to e4 check, which was a really interesting idea suggested by Judith. But the king comes to f7 and is trying to snake its way to g6 and f5. But you know what? It's interesting. What happens if after... Do you think after rook a3 he wants to take? For sure he wants to take on c6, right? Because I was thinking if after rook a3, what about king g6 first? And then I guess you hold on to this pawn. It yes, a, and after once that Once in I, a lifetime. <laughs> yeah. And then I go... Um... King f5. And then I wait. This is my one job in life. Ah, you just wait. Although you can push the age pawn. Oh, it's, it's not. I don't feel that this is so easy. Why cannot I push the age pawn? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just... I think at some point... I White thought you can go knight b2. Forcing things. Yeah, I yeah. am. But not now. I, I thought we did move earlier. Okay. Okay, so knight b2 now. Okay, well... Okay, this is the we position we have. Rook moves. takes a3, but of course rook c6. Of course, it's logical that she took it. But after it takes okay. knight f4. Ah... And that's exactly what's happened. Of course she will not allow king g6. No, 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 no. But how do you break this blockade? Well, rook so c1, one seven. big trick. You go rook c7 first, I guess. Yes? Yeah. No, I just wanted to mention that one trick that I fell into, like a, a rabbit in the... <laughs> it was a rook c4. You, you actually have to retreat your knight. Mm -hmm. You can't go king e3 because of rook e4. So just to point that out again. Put it on the board that would be a big oh dear and instead after knight after rook c4 you have to drop your i would give a check first ah yeah 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 that's even better give check and i would be really afraid to allow back. your king to f5 no you you don't want to do that that's black's dream to put the king on f5 yeah so let's refresh the position and uh, let's have a look. This is it. Ju Wenjun has just over one minute and a half. Leiting J just under three minutes. And Rook, uh, C4. Rook C4. Oh. Leiting J has to play Rook A7. It's the clearest path to equality. Drive the king backwards. So after rook a7, black is pushed back to the baseline. This is yep. what we're witnessing. I think after rook a7, king g8 will be played. What do you think? Yeah, king g8 makes a lot of sense. For the simple reason that you can start supporting a potential advance. And again, time is ticking down for Ju Wenjun. She has uh, just under one and a half minutes on the clock. How easy is it to make good moves in this endgame when you have so little time? But okay, is what it, about King E8? King e8, that is also possible. Knight h5, but right? Knight h5, and then the rook will swing over. Though no, after knight h... Uh... Okay, we have yeah. a decision, and the king has moved to 
F8. I didn't see that one. And again, white cannot fall into this tactic. The rook comes to king can't, can't king can't come to e3 because of rook to e4 check, and white will have to abandon protection of the knight. Well, my first question is, what happens if white just goes check again? I think that is the big question in the position because Leighton J can build herself up a time advantage just by playing rook a8, rook a7 and just keep going. Uh, presumably Ju Wenjun wants to walk her king all the way around. Yes, but uh, how? So king, rook a8, king, G, king e7, check again. Then you have to end up guess, with king. I guess the king will start D8. to walk to d8. And then, and then it gets a bit risky, right? To no, I give it check. I give it check on a8. Uh huh. So, so you let the king come out to c7, and after that, I move away with my knight, even back to d3 or g6, and I want to go rook h8 to capture your pawn from mm -hmm. the bank. Okay. Oh, well, that is uh, perhaps of them. Ju Wenjun's only hope, actually, because otherwise she cannot escape the checks. Look at the time. I know. <laughs> That's why I'm not making any moves on the board, because I don't want full focus on the time situation. And Lei Ting Jae, she is now ticking to under a minute. And she has that decision to make. Does she carry on checking the king? Or can she just give a check to the king with a white knight? Or is she simply moving the knight away to some square? And Leighton J under 35 seconds. And she no. moves her knight to the edge of the board. Okay, that's but fine. The knight that. can anchor but, herself on f3. But, 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 knight f3, pawn is off. Yeah. But you're just saying, yeah, it's a pawn. <laughs> Maybe she missed this. It's a pawn. No, she or cannot has she worked miss out this. this. No, she, she's worked out that she can attack the e6 pawn. So just, okay, okay we're going to see it. I, I'm not going to put it up. So the king is going to come to e3. And then her big idea is that after knight takes pawn, I guess knight to... Knight f4. Knight f4, yeah. And then... Uh... And then uh, knight... Rook c6. Uh, rook c6 and what, rook and h7? Step up with the king. King g4, can, can you... but then knight f7. Okay, we see knight f4 played, and uh, Ju Wenjun suddenly two pawns ahead. But Lei J's pieces are very active. Interesting. Maybe rook c6, rook h7, but then king g8, and then rook e7. Maybe rook c7, rook h7, what do you think? Because you cannot go knight yeah. f7 to knight check and rook f7. Well, we're going to see it because uh, rook c6 played and king e4. That's what I'm expecting from Leighton J. And it's happened. Ah, yeah, because knight f7, knight g6, rook f7. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So, knight f7. Knight g6. I'll put it up. And because knight g6, king g7, knight e5. Ah, no, even uh, blunder. No, 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 no. That, that would be a blunder. That would knight be... e5. And if king g8, knight, knight e7. So, actually, king e4 is drawing nice finish 
Very nice not, spot from Leighton J. It's not over yet, of course. So black has to be moving away to somewhere else with the knight to g4, let's say. And then if I have to check on g6, king has to go to e8. Wow. But you know, if the knight comes to... If it comes to g4, the game would instantly end in a draw. Knight because e6. there is a big trick. Knight e6. And yeah. uh, Lady J, she is sharp. She will spot such opportunities. Yeah. So just to reinforce that one quickly. Whilst and it's funny. If you go knight c4, it's the same with on the other side. That is going to be a draw. She and, played knight uh, there c4. But I think it's the same thing. It is exactly the same thing. And is the king close enough to catch the h pawn? It should be. Hmm. What a beautiful resource if uh, Lei J spots this one. No, she king doesn't go. Six. Because she, didn't, she just wants to play rook h7, I think, and... I can understand her if she does that. If that's the best, though, after rook h7, uh, knight d6 can be the move. Maybe king d4 now. Mm -hmm. King d4. Looks tempting. I also quite like rook e7 just to drive the king further away from the h pawn. And, and once then again. Rook h7? And then rook, yeah, rook h7, yeah? Yeah. Either way, the plan is clear. <laughs> White is uh, definitely going to snack on one of these two pawns. And what are we going to see? Rook e7, check. Are we going to see king d4? And now Lady J has moved to under the minute mark and king d4 is her choice. Well, uh, this game can be drawn because of this beautiful rook on the seventh rank cutting away the king. This is why white can uh, afford having two extra pawns down. Yeah, this is very cruel, isn't it, though? <laughs> you get to an end game two pawns up against your challenger and still it's a draw. Yeah, she also goes down under half a minute. I know, and it's ticking down. You have to make a move, Ju and Jun. Now down to under 20 seconds. And sadly for her, it looks like most of the moves will end in a very straightforward draw for Lei J And a uh, seven seconds! Oh, and moving the knight to b6. So what is she up to? Rook h7? Yeah, I think she's... We're think checking she's first. Covering, covering the check on a8, just in case. And also maybe playing knight to d7 is an idea of hers. Rook h7. Is she going to throw in a check to rook e7? I'm <laughs> the time is ticking down and I'm expecting Leighton J just to move her rook to attack one of those pawns. Yeah, small details and I'm not sure it has a big difference whether rook h7 first or check on e7 first and only after that rook h7. But once... White will want to try to grab the pawns, that's for sure. Rook a6 is also a nice move. Rook e7 check. And uh, still both players under the minute mark. Uh, King moving to d8 instantaneously. I'm expecting rook h7. But you know there is a trick. If let's say rook h7, black goes knight d7, and once you take on h6, I go e5, and it's going to be pinned that knight. Yeah, but you can also take, there's a knight f7 check at the end oh. of the night. Oh! So, yeah. 
So that's a good one. Knight to d7. I, th I think it will be played. I think she will try it out. The H pawn's life is doomed. Maybe Leighton J sees ghosts. And there we see Ju Wenjun now under 30 seconds. And it's ticking down. There's no way to hold on to the H pawn. All of Ju Wenjun's hopes are pinned on the advance of the E pawn. And 97 played. And we might see your idea in play, Judith, where white should capture that pawn on h6. It should be afraid of no ghost. And the point is that e5 can simply be met by knight takes e5. And there is a check on c7. Maybe the game will finish like this. Yeah, it's a nice finish. And she took f7. Yes, yeah, she's taken and e5 played. And we're going to see it finish. Let's see if she is going to take on e5, which has to be that's the simplest draw. And Lady J pausing, she's just working everything out. She has 33 seconds and ticking down just to calculate two moves in advance. And knight takes pawn. This is it. Leighton J surviving an extremely difficult position once more. And that's it. Game seven finishes in a draw. Whoa, what a roller coaster of a game. What a game. Five hours game. It was quite stressful, it was ups and downs. We can say mm -hmm. that it was a very interesting game. But of course, uh, Juve and June, it was not exactly what she thought. At one point of the game, for sure, she was more ambitious than this. Yeah. And uh, what did you think of uh, Juve and June's surprise? She employed the Karakar for the very first time. Did it well, work it out well for her? It worked out excellently for her because uh, she made a surprise, she unbalanced her opponent, she created uh, some fantastic opportunities for her in a difficult position. I mean, that was uh, quite stressful, the compensation what White had. But after that, uh, she was very close to, to, to get an almost winning position. Mm -hmm. She misplayed it, but uh, I think she should be still happy with today's game because she still has five more games to go, three whites, and uh, she can show that she she can outplay her opponent. Yeah, and uh, let's take a look at the scoreboard. And you can see after today's well, draw, we see that once again, Ju Wenjun, she still has... A one point deficit over Leighton J and Leighton J now will play with the black pieces tomorrow. It was a very well balanced game. I mean, I was certainly entertained by it all. And going into tomorrow's game, Ju Wenjun will have the white pieces. Do you, can we expect more surprises from her? Well, this is a big question. How much is she ready to make a surprise with White? Because, of course, it depends very much on her preparation, whether she prepared it in advance. Such a scenario that she will have to make huge changes as today. But uh, it also depends a lot on her mood and how flexible she is and how she feels. What is her analysis and estimation on today's uh, surprise, what she did and how much energy it took out of her and how she felt during the game, whether did she had the dilemma, okay, what am I going to be playing? I don't see the plan, whether she was a worrying kind during the game, which we don't know. Or she said, okay, I was very confident. I had great chances. So I believe that I should be going... Uh, out of uh, out of comfort zone for myself and the opponent and come up with something else but of course uh, you're risking also at the same time when you when you makes you play something which you were not prepared very well beforehand
Yeah. And uh, so that's that's something that we can say to Ju and Jun to take the positives from today. But okay, her challenger Leighton J, she does have that one point advantage. What can we expect from her tomorrow, Judith? Well, I think for her it's very important to to stabilize herself, to understand that uh, her opponent can do anything. She can come up with the old preparation and the old system what she plays, but she's ready to give surprises to her opponent. She's ready to fight until the very end in this match, so she will grab every opportunity and create new chances for herself. And also she has to understand that uh, when she has a good position as she had today, she has to be more careful, not allowing these kind of breakouts from the opponent. So she has to understand, know exactly that there is not going to be an easy way up to the very end. Yeah, absolutely, Judith. This is not going to be an easy match at all. As we see both players just to dive into their resourceful resourcefulness and also demonstrate their grit and resilience and uh, so far, the match here in Chongqing has begun with a very hard fought draw. And tomorrow it will be game eight. Ju Wenjun will return with the white pieces. Judith also returns again to share with us all her insights. And thank you everyone for watching at home. And we will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. See you tomorrow. <laughs>